You're listening to You Would Think, the Philadelphia Flyers podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Collington, and joining me, as always, Mr. Kevin Durso. How are you, buddy? I'm doing great. I mean, the playoffs are on. It's a great time of year. First round is wrapping up. It's time for us to do another show, you know? It's It's been a fun couple of weeks of hockey. Um, we do have some Flyers news to get into, um, but it really is going to be a playoff-centric show. There's really not a whole lot of Flyers talk. Uh, before we get into anything, um, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter at YWT Podcast. Follow Kevin at Kevin underscore Durso. Hit all the buttons. Follow us everywhere. SportstalkPhilly.com. All the things. Okay. Um, getting right into it. Not a whole mm-hmm. lot of preamble today. Um, Flyers <laughs> president search. That's really the only big story. Uh, we're still kind of operating under the assumption uh, that Danny Briere is going to be the general manager. Um, right. And I don't really think there's a whole lot of names floating around in that conversation. No, I uh, mean, but, like, as, but as far as the ahead. president goes, it is a little bit more of an open, uh, an open book there. Yeah, there's a lot of kind of bits and pieces that you kind of have to assemble together with all of these things. I mean, it was really kind of active the last week or so, because it really feels like the interview process is ongoing at this point. Now, like they're into it. Um, I mean, obviously, I guess the first thing to say is yes, to this point, Danny Briere has not officially been named the GM. It still seems like all signs point to this. Um, There is a kind of a belief that they're waiting to hire the president. And then that way they can kind of, Make sure make it well, make it seem like it kind of is a complete all on board thing that then the president decides I'm going to drop the interim tag. There is no search, that kind of thing. Instead of doing it in reverse order, they're going to try to do it maybe a different way. Okay. the first thing I think that really needs to be talked about. And I'm, you know, I got a few places to, you know, credit and cite for all a lot of this information. But is the concept that this may not be the traditional president of hockey operations. Everybody, you know, when you think of president of hockey operations, what you think of is it's a role that oversees the whole thing, oversees the general manager, the assistant general manager or managers, scouting, development, you know, all of this, everything. The belief is, and I want to give credit, the guys at Snow the Goalie really had this first and foremost, I would say, um, that this is more, maybe more geared toward the business side of things that... You know, almost that this would be somebody who more or less helps to market the team in a way. It, it, it's it's really interesting, kind of the idea that this person may almost be like an internal PR director within the hockey side of things that works kind of with the business side too. So it, it's not your traditional, you know, and thing. And, and kind of, and here's where it kind of makes sense because when you read into, you can read into that part of it what you will, but when you consider who's leading the search as far as we know. And again, similar reports, Snow the goalie had some stuff. Anthony DeMarco had stuff that the search is predominantly being led by Dan Hilferty, Val Camillo. And then you have Billy King and Neil Glassberg, who are both working for outside kind of consulting agencies that are involved. Neil Glassberg, if anybody recalls, we, when we talked about John Tortorella getting hired over the last summer, he is the founder of the coaches agency, which is the kind of the coaching and, you know, assistant coach and executive representation, if you will. So, you know, and, you know, they're adding perspective for better or worse. And the worse is that for a little while anyway, and we'll get into the reason why it's not anymore, there was a potential conflict of interest uh, in play. So how about some names? You want to get into well, some names or do you want to react to that first? Before we hit some names, um, I do want to mention that it does kind of make sense that you're heading towards maybe more of a business-oriented uh, person for this role because, let's be honest, the team, at least over the short period of time here, is probably not going to do particularly well on the ice. Mm-hmm. And we know that historically that means that the building gets pretty empty and the stub hub prices get pretty cheap. And... Mm-hmm. <laughs> So it makes a little sense that you're bringing in somebody who's going to be focused on, you know, how are we going to get the building full? How are we going to be trying to make money while the on ice product isn't necessarily the the thing getting the butts in the seats? Right. And well, and you know what? The first thought that I had, and this is not a name that's involved in the interview process as far as we know anyway, because I haven't heard it to this point. But I feel like this is where Eric Lindros came from when it was speculated at the beginning. 
if you're looking for somebody who's resonating with a fan base and trying to boost some business and doesn't necessarily need all of the hockey operation smarts, then that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Like, so maybe that's where the name, ha- like that name came from way back at the beginning with the idea that maybe they're going to go there. Now it's not part, like Lindros doesn't seem like he's part of this anymore. We'll get into that. Um, so how about right. some names? You want to go well, through for the, some names? For the record, um, for, for the record, for the Lindros ending up as, uh, whenever George Peros moves on, I could see him being the next president of player safety. Or director for all of his safety. work with concussions and things like that, you're saying? And he's he's done yeah, a ton I mean, of work. He well, knows a ton about the information. And in a in a league that's heading towards the protected stars era, or at least it very well should be, who knows more about protecting stars than Eric Lindros? Well, for and for a league that is consistently inconsistent at, at kind of enforcing the very rules that they should. I mean, like and not for nothing, and I'm not trying to jump to all of our playoff stuff, and this is really not a footnote of the series I'm going to get into throughout the course of it, but we just had a player in a series fracture his neck in the middle of a game on a minor penalty call, no yep. suspension, and yep. somehow or other, by the way, try to come back and play in the middle of it, which I think is nothing <laughs> more than the player. I think is nothing more than the player kind of just trying to tough it out as they usually do. Play. Yep. But regardless, if you're supposed to be protecting your players and a guy fractures his neck on a hit that should never happen in a game and be an immediate five in game and suspension worthy, Ugly. then what are we doing here? You know, yep. like that's where you're right. All um, right. Let's get, so let's get into the real names. name. Yes. Well, the first part of it was when the interviews got started was that Emily Castingay and Scott Mellonby were two names that were out there that definitely interviewed. Okay. Um, now I'm going to just jump, I'm just going to cut to the chase right away and say that within, a, within a matter of days, Emily Castingay was no longer in the running anyway. She, she decided to Vancouver stay Canucks in that Vancouver. She was staying with them. Yep. Correct. Um, now I got nothing on Scott Mellenby. He's interviewed. Seems like he wants to be potentially part of this. I mean, the, the interesting thing about Mellenby to me is now, first of all, right away, oh, I'll go into him in a minute. Let's just keep going with the names. Because uh, Doug Wilson was supposed to be potentially getting an interview. I'm not sure if that's happened yet. I, I believe it likely has because it sounded like it was maybe over last weekend. Doug Wilson um, looking to get back into hockey, obviously, yep. after taking some time off to get healthy. Yep. Um, and then oh, what, while Emily Castingay's name was linked to this whole thing, so was Cami Granados, who's also an assistant GM in Vancouver. Um, some have actually gone so far as to say that potentially she could be the front runner in terms of their interest level, which is interesting. Um, Dave Poulin's name has been brought up. Obviously, we've heard Ray Shero's name being linked. Again, there's not really a clear cut report out there that he actually got an interview. But, you know, and then there's a belief that Shero would like to be a GM again, not necessarily a president of hockey operations. So maybe this isn't the right spot for him. Uh, I do want as a bit of a retirement promotion. Sure. And I um I do want to clarify, by the way. So this the report that Emily Castingay was staying in Vancouver, that was Elliot Friedman who said that on 32 Thoughts. So okay. let's wipe that one out. So let's kind of get into some of these because so I'll start with Scott Mellonby. And Mellonby's an interesting one to me because I think before everybody freaks out about the fact that he played for the Flyers in the 80s, because I know everybody's gonna do that. That's the last connection he has to the Flyers. Once he was traded away, now over 30 years ago, he hasn't been tied to the Flyers organization in any way since, other than maybe to make an alumni appearance, like at an alumni game. Like, that's it. He's risen through the ranks in hockey operations sides of things. He's been, actually even further than that, he's been an assistant coach at one point, then an assistant GM, director of player personnel. He did all that with Montreal. But if you time. recall... If you recall, with Montreal, when everything was starting to blow up around Mark Bergevin, everybody thought that Mellonby was getting the job. And when it was apparent he wasn't, he resigned. Yep. He stepped away. He thought, so, he thought he was getting that job for sure. Sure. And, you know, this is a guy, like, he knows hockey operations. He did that assistant GM job in Montreal for, I believe, seven years. Like, then you know what you're doing in that circle. You kind of know how a front office is supposed and to that's operate. One of those, and that's one of those franchises, man. Like, the, Montreal knows how the league runs. Well, sure, exactly. <laughs> that's so, not just any old front office. So, and you're going to hear me say this a lot in the next couple minutes. The key question is, what do the Flyers want in the role? Because if they want it on the more traditional side, then Mellonby sounds like a great candidate. 
But if it's more PR and marketing kind of guy stuff, like I'm not sure that that's Scott Mellonby. I don't know him to be. Oh, jeez. I haven't heard now. I heard that name for a day and then didn't. Probably mostly on Twitter. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. But either way. Um, but I'm not sure. Like, I don't get that. Imp- like, in fairness, I don't get that impression from Scott Mellonby that he's the marketing PR guy. Right. I, I totally get him as the hockey operations guy. Sure. Um, now, Poulin is in a similar situation in terms of, you know, yes, he's a former Flyer captain. But again, once he left, been in a bunch of different roles with a bunch of different places you know we know him certainly on the broadcasting side now with tsn and all the stuff he's done over there he worked for the toronto maple leafs for a little while certainly has great knowledge of the game and where it's going and all that type of stuff and maybe he even fits that pr side a little better because of you know you broadcast you're an ex-player an ex-captain of the team that all lines up right you know like that makes a lot of sense I want to say right up front, and that's kind of all I have on Poolin, by the way, but I want to say right up front, if you're asking me who I think the perfect candidate for the job is based on all these names, it's Doug Wilson. By a freaking mile. Like, in terms of, he feels like the perfect candidate in terms of experienced general manager to put right near Danny Briere and say, here's how you do it. And my so... only question would be, how good is his health? Like, obviously, he's interviewing, so he's got to feel a lot better, but... Well, and the nice thing is this is also a position that doesn't necessarily require as much day-to-day oversight necessarily. Sure. Um, and, and, and for me, as long as he's able to do the job, I'd be making the push for him. But again, it's, 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 is that what they want? Is that what he wants? Or does Doug Wilson want to stay in the San Jose Sharks kind of family? Because I feel like... I feel like he feels like there's some unfinished business there. He might. I don't know. I mean, I don't look, I don't get the impression and I don't know what the story is back there to kind of indicate how I don't want to say like how willing they're welcome them him back with open arms kind of thing. Cause I don't think it was like ever, he, it, seems it wasn't like contentious. He's been, well, right. And it seems like he's been kind of hanging out around their front office since he's been showing an interest in getting back involved since he's gotten, you know, to whatever stage of his, I'm not sure where he's at in his treatment, but you sure. know, he's gotten to whatever stage of that he's gotten to. Um, it'll be interesting to see if he's willing to move out of San Jose, California to come run this dumpster fire of a team kind of thing. So you, it, we'll see. Well, we'll and see. you have to, like the the question you have to ask with that type of stuff is very much the same question, like in terms of a, a John Tortorella question. It's like you know, if, if John Tortorella sounds motivated, like look at the opportunity I have to bring this back to what it used to be. I'm also, going to run with that. If that's the way you're thinking, then that's the way you're thinking. But yeah, we can't get inside of their heads to figure out if that's how they're right. thinking. Well, I also think that John Tortorella was sold a false bill of goods and has simply tried to make the best of it since he's been here. Yeah, but he's also the type of guy who's stubborn enough to not back down from the challenge once I he gets in. I absolutely agree too. with you. So that's why that's I'm saying he's making of, the best. That's kind of where you're at with that, right? You know. It, but it, I like, absolutely think thought he thought that he was walking into a team that was just a you know. A superstar a coach, away, maybe, a, or or a coaching change away, you know. Well, no, see, I don't think he felt like he was. They were a coaching change away, but I think he thought that with. Well, let's put it this way: I, I thought he thought he could get more out of the team that he inherited than he could. Well, no, I'll give you a good reason why he thought that. May, why he may have thought that because he thought he was going to have Sean Couturier and he thought he was going to have Cam Atkinson, and then all That's of a true. sudden somebody had to tell him, "You're not going to have those guys all year." And and, and they what probably told now? him he was going to have. Um, Ryan Ellis, too. <laughs> Apparently now anybody can have Ryan Ellis if the price is right. Is there a price? Or do like are yeah, you going to drive to the airport? Yeah, no, the, the need to desperately get to the cap floor if you're a team out right. there that needs the, it. That's about what it is. The only price is going to be the Uber to the airport. I, okay, so back to the president search here. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, if you're picking today... Who who do you think is getting the job if you had to put oh, money goodness. away right now? I know I it's don't still kind of wide open. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't, 
No, I don't have like a good feel on where it's going because I because I think that there's more than just the handful of names that we're talking about. Um, I do want to bring up Cami Granado as a, as the option that she is also because it's an interesting option, you know. Yeah. And we kind of we kind of talked about this really briefly before we started the show. You know, first of all, you know, similar to Casting Gay working in the same organization at the moment, same role. Um, look, you'd be getting a legend of the sport, you know, a legend of U.S. women's hockey. If you and in having her oversee this department, Absolutely. and it and it's very outside the box for the Flyers, and I kind of right, and I kind of think that would benefit them. I think it might be a breath of fresh air for a team that and a franchise that really kind of needs it. And and look, she's in like and this is what we were talking about before we started. She's in every hockey circle imaginable. Comes from a hockey family. She's married to Ray Ferraro. She's worked in hockey for her entire life. Has continued to climb the ranks in the last several years. And I think that you've got a reasonable, legitimate candidate there. Like, I don't think that that's one that you just brush aside at all. I agree with you. I think she's experienced and she would bring a lot to the role. You know what else I'll say about her, too? I think she could fit the bill of of like being on both sides of the spectrum, being able to kind of do the businessy PR side of things because you're a promoter of the game at that point. You, Absolutely. Your place in history is your place in history, right? But you're also a smart hockey person, you know? Like that's kind of part of the job too. So I think that's all part of the equation. I think that if they can find somebody who can do both – that like that's really where you're hitting the sweet spot. So that's really where everything is. I don't really have much more flyer stuff beyond that, to be honest. I mean, look, I'm not because one thing I am not going to do over the course of this off season is kind of get heavily invested in a bunch of trade rumors until we really start seeing stuff attraction here. Right. Like nothing's happening right now. I know like and I'm not trying to sit here and dismiss what like that Ryan Ellis is available, for example. No, that's all very legit. And there's plenty of other names that are going to be available, but I am not trying to speculate who stays, who goes, this, that, the other thing right now. No, they don't even have a guy during the playoffs. And they don't even have like they don't even have the interim tag off of Danny Briere yet. I don't think he's exactly taking swings for the fences right this second. Nothing big is going to happen with nobody like officially in charge. Right. Uh so can we get into the fun stuff now? I, th- yep. I feel like we have kind of we've eaten our vegetables, right? We've talked about the flyers, we have done our chores. Now we get to have the fun stuff. And and the thing was is I I knew coming into tonight when we were going to do the show 15 minutes on flyer stuff. Just yep. Give me 15 minutes on here's where we're at with all this stuff. Cause we're going to take two weeks off from talking about it. Let's get into the fun stuff. There you and go. The, and the fun stuff is the Stanley cup playoffs. So, uh, I, hey, you I talk, will, do you want to talk about a former flyer coach? We will. Let me start <laughs> here. Well, so full, okay. dis- full disclosure, we are recording on Monday evening. We are recording during devil's Rangers and starting for- the show. <laughs> For that reason, it's currently about halfway through the game right now. It's currently four on four. Uh, for that reason, we are going to start out on the west, uh, the Western Conference. We're going to start with the West Coast games and work our way to the East. Uh, so where are we starting here? Uh, we are starting with the one, the only, the goatee himself, Mr. <laughs> Dave Hackstall. Dude, the goatee's got to go so the bad. goatee, like, baby. It- to go so bad but nonetheless um this was this was a fun freaking series let me tell you uh, this was fun um yeah. and i'm you know li- like obviously both of us the, the the best the best thing that could happen is i know and i know you're reacting to something that devil's just scored shorthanded there. we'll get there we'll get there um uh the thing that's because the full disclosure, we left the last show and I even said, can't wait to see how wrong we are with all of the predictions we made. Well, this yep. is one that we both got wrong because I don't yep. think we had the defending Stanley cup champions bowing out in round one to it, you know? And I said, I think I'm pretty sure I said on the show, maybe I'm wrong. Cause we were all wrong about Vegas. And maybe I'm making the same mistake we all made three, four, five years ago, whatever year that was, 2017. Time is a flat circle. Um, and, you know, made the same mistake. And <laughs> and we'll get into their second round matchup as we move on a little bit further here. But Sure. But 
I don't know. I'm I'm probably going to make the same mistake again, but I don't know. I don't know how good I feel about it. They so my my manager at work is a former uh, semi pro high level hockey player, and I kind of gotten him back into the NHL a little bit over the last year and a half or so. And he asked me, he's like, "So what's the deal with with Seattle? Like, what's their <laughs> what's their thing?" You know, he doesn't he hasn't watched a lot this season. Mm-hmm. And I told him, I said, they, they don't really have a super duper star, although Matt, Matty Beneers is trying. Um, he will become one eventually, I season. think. Right. It's the the issue is with them is when you put them next to a team like Colorado, and even though Colorado was missing a lot, Crippled I mean, they really were missing. I mean, yeah, and, it, and it only got worse as the series went on. Let's be real. That's the one but, team that shouldn't overreact from a first round exit like the no, Colorado I Avalanche can come back next year with with the same exact squad and they're going to win in the first round more times than not no and I can't you know I can't fault them for what like like for what happened I mean there's a couple of there's a couple of form like things that go into the formula that Seattle followed that just end up working a, one really good one is score first in every game that yep. usually tends to help a little bit but you know, toward the end of it, and this is how crippled they were down the stretch. I mean, they played, a, and let's this way, McCarr got suspended for a game in the middle of it, too. That that doesn't help. McCarr um, got suspended for game six, wasn't he? Or was it game five? No, I think it was four or five. Yeah, either okay. four or five. It was one I of I thought those. the hit was in game four and he was suspended. For then I, that might have been it, yeah. And because it was, it was a game that they ended up losing, that Colorado, yeah, Colorado lost. And they won game six when he came back, I believe you're right. So, um but the thing about that is, is that after a while, especially down the stretch, like they won, a, like they won, Colorado won game two. And I remember why, and game, the way game six went also, same thing. There was a bunch of different people scoring for Colorado in those games. But after a while, I was watching some of the other ones and going, is anybody else other than Nathan McKinnon and Miko Rantanen going to score a goal? That they, they kind of just looked out of gas. And I know they played a lot of hockey last year and, they played really hard down the stretch to get in to make the, to to win the division to get where they got, mm-hmm. and and I think the injuries just caught up to them. Like I said, I Seattle just plays such a good team hockey, such good grind mm-hmm. it out. Almost, I don't want to say poor man's, especially given the results, but they they almost feel like the West Coast New York Islanders. A little bit, yeah. They that's that's a good comparison. They just kind of grind you down, and they don't have anybody doing anything special. But Brock Nelson and you well, know eventually Matthew Barzell and right, yeah, I hear you. But no, but I'm not talking about the Matthew Barzell. Matthew Barzell has some skill and some flashiness. I'm talking well, about right. Brock Matthew Nelson Barzell. And, no, so and Matthew Barzell is Matty Beneers, and right. is, is to Matty Beneers anyway. And then Brock Nelson is to. Well, and he this look, this guy didn't get to really play much in the series, the but roster. is to no, no, I was gonna say is to Jared McCann because that's really the guy I think of. Um, but man, like it, it, exactly, and I, look, if you're gonna go to the injury list for Colorado, I think where you start is Gabe Landeskog. I mean, Captain, you have to play yeah. well because we're gonna get into a series. Um, we're gonna get into a series in probably a couple minutes. Really, it might be the next one we get into where it's the opposite. What happens when you get your captain back for the playoffs versus, yep. oh, he's not coming back now and he won't be back at all? Yep. Like, it's a little bit of a gut punch before you even play a game in the playoffs. Yeah. And, you know? And obviously they didn't have him for the regular season, too, so they did get used to playing without him. But they it's thought he was – Well, right. And they thought he was heading towards coming back. And then about a week and a half, two weeks before the playoffs start, they get the news that he's not. And that's got to suck a little bit of air out of the room. And then your armor is just a little bit thinner and just a little bit easier to punch through. And that's that's kind of what Seattle ended up doing. Like, they kind of just ground them out over a long series. And sure, they can do that to anybody. They It might take them 28 games, but they might do the thing. The thing that's really interesting is, you know, way back in October, I went out to California for – a little bit of a stretch of time. And I went to the Anaheim ducks season opener, which was against Seattle. And you, for whatever reason, like you just, they didn't even, they didn't end up, even end up winning the game. They lost the game in overtime that night to the team that just finished with, I believe like that has the best odds, right? Anaheim's got the best odds coming up in the yeah. draft lottery. And Seattle just won a playoff series against the defending Stanley cup champions. 
And yet, as I'm watching that game that night, I'm looking at Seattle, I'm going, man, they're just piling on shot after shot. They're up to 40 some odd shots, and there's five minutes left in the third period. They're just piling it on. It's a great goaltending performance at the other end. It's even making this a game right now. That's something here. And all of the new guys were scoring goals. It was Bjorkstrand. It was like, like that particular night. So I kind of already got a sense from day one. This is a little different. This team's a little different. And I'm so impressed by the way that they played in this series. It was one of my favorites to watch. I thought that, you know, first of all, as soon as it started, you could tell Seattle wasn't backing down from the challenge. They had the chops to win more than just a game or two in it. Credit to Dave Haxtall. Sometimes, the, you know, we've talked about this before in other situations. Sometimes the first job isn't the right one or doesn't go as planned. And the experience can go a long way in the future. That's well, was, what we're seeing there with, you know, from Philly to where he is now also. That sometimes you and, just got to go through it and take the experience and run with it later in another opportunity. And sometimes your goalie stands on his brain because Philip Grubauer was spectacular. When oh, and that, uh, sure. Guys. He was, you know, he's the reason they won the series. He's the, one, he's the every primary game they won, reason. Every game they won, Colorado scored two or fewer. Yep. Exactly. And, you know, so he, here's the thing when it comes to a team like where Seattle was at. When you're a wild card team, and even more so when you're going up against a team that expectations are they're going to win, like the defending Stanley Cup champions, the belief is from within, at least probably from within the room, or at least when you're watching thing is the belief that you like we all feel watching it is it, your ability to win the series only goes as far as each game. You win the first one, whether it's game one or game two, whatever it is. It could even be game three when you're down 2-1. And the first thought you have is, all right, now do it again. And if you do it again, usually now we're in game three or game four, and you even it up at two or you know whatever it may be, then you sit there and you go, all right, now you're in it. You've got a shot. You know, Can you get to the next one? Can you get to the cusp of winning the series? And then you win the third one, either five or six, and you really start to say that anything's possible. And I think that that belief just kept growing. As soon as they won game four in overtime to tie the series back up, I knew that they had a shot. Yep. Way more than just this is going to be go back to Colorado and it's going to end the way that all of the other series do. Right. You know? This isn't just some valuable playoff experience for a new team. This, right. is, this is a no, real squad here. that's ready to win. And... We've already said it. Colorado was easily the more talented team on paper. They always were going to be. When you have McKinnon, Ranton, and McCarr, the stars that they have. But here's the reality of it. When you can get 15 different players to score a goal, and you score first in every game in the series, and you get the goaltending that Grubauer gave them, and you get the buy-in from the entire room, it can amount to something really special. And yep. That this was really cool to see Seattle in year two do this, not because it's unusual. You know, Seattle could have been built exactly like Vegas was and did and became an instant success, even like as, as early as last year when it was their first year, right? But it's what they did last year to this year that makes it even more impressive. That it's last year they were nothing like this, they were nothing more than a lowly expansion team that was still finding their way, and well. What else can you say? But they have found their way. They, you know, and I, I know one of the things I was most excited about in this series was game three. Couldn't wait to see what a crowd in Seattle was. And as soon as I watched, awesome. as soon as I watched them score the first goal of that game, I immediately went, oh, yeah, this works. This crowd's. Yep. This and, works. And you know what? I'll say something underrated here. The wide shot after they score best in the league. It's great. I think the dual good. scoreboard gives them the best post-goal crowd pan in the league. 100%. Yeah, it was it was excellent. I mean, the whole thing was excellent and I, you know, we'll talk more about them when we get into the second round portion of things, so, but Yeah, let's let's actually get into uh the next team that will play playoff games in Seattle. Uh it okay, won't so be you go it, to this Yeah, one. It, it won't be right at first, you know, cuz uh Dallas does have home ice here in this series. Uh, but the Dallas Stars defeat the Minnesota Wild in six games. Uh, this was a really fun series. Yeah. It, it, it started game one with double overtime. Uh, Philip Gustafson was an absolutely spectacular. 
spectacular. I think 51 saves, something ridiculous like that. Yeah. The, I mean, that's the thing about ga- like game one really set the tone for the type of series that we thought we were getting. And, yep. you know, ga- maybe game two was a mistake you know, on Minnesota's part that they shouldn't have changed the goaltending out. That kind of cost them in game two. They go back to it in game three. It works. So now you have your answer at that point. You know, Gustafson was great for Gustafson two games. Was getting the Flurry was the not the for the one. And, and it wasn't all Flurry's fault. I'm not trying to say no. that. But you he had your answer. He didn't play great, though. No, he didn't. And that's the whole. But the whole point was exactly that. You had your answer. Yep. Play Gustafson for the rest of the series. And they did. Here's what I'll say about the overall kind of scope of this series, which is just, you know, I love the way that the Dallas core is built and the way they've built this whole thing. You get Miro Heiskin and Jake Ottinger and Jason Robertson all in the same draft. Yep. You still have Tyler Sagan and Jamie. Tyler Sagan turning back the clock with four goals in a series. Like, and, hello. And that's and after then, Jamie Benn did it all season with, I think he ended up with 70 yeah. points. And Jamie Benn had a, had a big goal in this series as well. I mean, you know, in one of the games that they dominated. Let's go to your favorite guy on the planet, Rope Hintz, Rope who is Hintz, emerging babies. more and more into a star. Is he like, still leading the playoffs in scoring? He yes, was he is. for a while. 12 points. Nobody else had 12. Oh, he sure is. 12 points. A hat trick in game two. Like, just outstanding. You know? uh, yeah, he has been absolutely stellar. Uh, that power play unit is clicking. And doesn't it feel like every player we talked about in when we previewed this you know how much we, you know, how you know, but how much we like you know how much we like what Wyatt Johnston does right and he gets a goal by the end of the series and you know they're just you know and, and oh by the way once game 3 was over and they were down 2-1 in the series Jake Ottinger just flat out locked it up and said I'm not letting in anything for the rest of the series practically no. No. I mean he gave up 3 goals for the rest of the series after that this this next we'll get into the second round preview in a minute here but this second round matchup is a matchup of great goaltending and just two teams that believe in what they're doing. And it's going to be incredibly fun to watch. Oh, yeah. Um, but Dallas, I, I don't know what to say about Dallas. They were just so impressive. You know, you go down 2-1, you come and back and you win a gritty game four. Yep. And that and that was the end of the series. Minis- they, they broke Minnesota in that game four. Even though the series yeah. was tied. Yeah. Minnesota just well, especially just when you're going home. Yeah, right. especially when you're going home and then, you know, it, yeah, you could just you could kind of see it. And uh, like that the thing and the thing that I like about the way they're built is what we talked about all along and it's kind of combining the two groups that I talked about. You get that you get that draft year in 2017 where you get three cornerstone players at each position by the way. And yet you haven't moved on from the guys that were always part of it yet and you haven't had to. Yeah, there's we, no there's, We've been singing Dallas's praises on this show for a very long time. They have very, very, very successfully transitioned from the Jamie Ben, Tyler Sagan, Ben Bishop era to the, you know, through the Anton Hudobin era, now into the Jake Ottinger, uh, Jason Robertson, Rope Hintz, Miro Heiskin, and like all these young guys without ever missing a beat. I mean, they, they had, I think. I think they missed the playoffs once, but I, other than right. that, the Dallas Stars have been one of those teams that's in the conversation every year. No, and, and oh by the way, oh by the way, we went this whole stretch of time without talking about somebody else who could who wasn't in the series for good, like we didn't talk about him for good reason. Joe Pavelski goes out in game one, yep, and you know one of their key contributors throughout the year, and and, and expected they don't to miss a beat, and expected to be be one of their big playoff guys. Sure, and well, and the only like the good news from here is that the anticipation is he will be back at some point soon, potentially here. Interesting. So, I mean, there was talk that he was at least making the trip to you know Minnesota when they went back for Game Six. He didn't play, but you know that's the real that's the real you know possibility here is that if they get a player like that back. I, you know they're a scary team. So 
Do we want to do the second round matchup kind of now after we've talked about both, both uh, first round matchups, or do we want to uh, save we'll hold them all for the, the end? end. Okay. Hold it off to the end. So you um, so want to go to the number one seed in the West? Yeah, let's transition here. Probably the most lopsided first round matchup here. Uh, the the Vegas, only series that didn't go six. Yeah, the Vegas Golden Knights kind of just steamroll the, the Winnipeg Jets. Um, you know, Winnipeg, they really did try. They came out and they won game one. And then Vegas, uh, we got the old gentleman sweep here. <laughs> Winnipeg takes the first one. Vegas takes the next four straight. You the better almost, the better team won. Oh, for sure. And you almost forget that Winnipeg won game one because, you know. Vegas it, certainly it just, did. Yeah. I mean. Well, you, you hear tra- about burn the tape. Vegas did a phenomenal well, job. Of just... I, not, not completely. And I'll tell you why. Okay. Because it was an interesting start to the series that Winnipeg gets the game one win the way they did too. Pretty dominantly, actually. Um, but Vegas responds in game two. And then Winnipeg has that crazy rally in game three and gets it tied somehow. I mean, they were down 4-1 in that game, and they get it back to 4-4 in the final minute. And losing in double overtime really felt like a major blow for Winnipeg. It felt like they were never the same after that. And, you know, look, we all kind of saw i'm sure a lot of people out there who listen also saw what was said after the game and that team kind of oh they've not only did they break but they're in for some major changes to come too blake blake wheeler's got to be gone i fully imagine so and then shifley's probably gone yeah i think so like i think this core is getting blown up It, it has to i you okay Flip a coin on Nick Ehlers. You probably keep Kyle Connor. Flip a coin sure. on Josh Morrissey, and everyone else is gone. In, you know, who, in, including Hellebuck's who else, definitely like, gone. Yeah, you got to move him because he's going to be one of the easiest pieces to move. He's got Con- one one year Connor left on his contract. Ha- Connor Hellebuck, Buffalo Saber. Ooh, Buffalo needs a goalie too. Well, not needs mm. one, but like if they had oh, a veteran, one, oh, goalie, one year a one year. Gap. Especially since Craig Anderson's hanging them up and you got two younger guys over there right now. That's not a horrible idea. Uh, it's, you know, it's either there or Pittsburgh. But either way, um, as for Vegas, to shift gears to Vegas aside, yeah. they seem like they were just getting it all. Like the goaltending from Laurent Brassois was great. Um Jack Eichel and scored his, Steven. scored his first playoff goal in this series. So congratulations to Jack Eichel for finally making the playoffs and actually, you know, contributing. Sure. And that's look, it's great, great for him to see him kind of get that taste of it and start to kind of make the impact that people figured he would. Um, and then, you know. The the real big part of it, because I I I don't want to gloss over to mention Chandler Stevenson there by the way because that's a really, you know that's obviously he was great in the series as well, but you get Mark Stone back and it's an immediate impact, and look Vegas is still a battered team because they had guys in and out and all over the place during the course of this series. I mean there were defensemen who were in and out toward the end because you know it's this guy's banged up he can't go tonight all that and look maybe you don't do that if it's a three if it's not a three one series I get it but. You know, and look, the extra time that they just had is going to be really good for them. Um, but the, and the, you know, because they're the only team in the playoffs. Like I said, they they're the only team that didn't even need a game six, let alone a game seven. But yeah, they took care of business. I got I got a question for you when it comes to Mark Stone. Anyway, is there anybody who's more? Is there anybody in the league more fun to watch when he scores a goal than that guy? I mean, the know, dude's got the best sellies in the league. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. <laughs> Uh, this series was a lot of fun to watch, but again, at a certain point, just we, I believe we watched the implosion, the final run of this iteration of the Winnipeg Jets. Sure. And, and look, I, I think that Vegas being the team that didn't make the playoffs last year was determined to make it this year. Didn't just make it, but like, you know, obviously they were the best team. They in the wanted Western to send Conference. a message. They, uh, well, and boy, yeah. did they ever in this series then. Now, listen, the next one's not going to, and we're saving the predictions, but the next one's not going to be that, that easy. No. And let's are not talk- getting a team rolling over and, you know, whatever in this one, but let's talk about that. Well, move and on. let's, let's talk about who did make it through. Cause if you're following along at home, this is the Edmonton LA matchup. Mm-hmm. And we talked about this 
quite a bit on the last show because we had Phil Deneau versus Connor McDavid, you know, Andre Kopitar versus Leon Dreisaitl. And the series kind of played out like that. Like, there they weren't a whole lot of blowouts. This was a pretty tight, pretty contentious series. The LA Kings did a spectacular job, spectacular, impeccable job <laughs> of neutralizing Connor McDavid and, for the most part, Leon Dreisaitl as well. Uh, he did have mm-hmm. some success, of course. Unfortunately for LA fans, the Edmonton uh, general manager has finally decided to put a team around Connor McDavid and they got enough depth scoring that. They made it through the first round. They beat the uh, L.A. Kings in six. They got enough around them at this t- point in time, but it wasn't always in this series exactly like that either. It's fair, you know. Like it, it can't kind of it can't come and go. It can't just disappear. Um, it's still because it's still the McDavid Drysital show for the most part. I mean, because those two are just incredible in what their abilities are and what they can do and you know all of that and like you don't see anybody else playing like this you know you just don't but really you just said it what really will help this team in the playoffs is when you do get everyone involved you got you know Clem Costin scoring goals Kyler Yamamoto gets his first goal of the series and it's the game winner of the series yep. Zach Hyman in overtime with with a goal at one point of Andrew Kane picked up his scoring down the stretch of the series Ryan McLeod I'm, contributing. I got to tell you one player. I, I got to tell you one player who I'm really impressed with on their team that I I might have mentioned on the last one, but you know, even if I did, I don't mind repeating it. Evan Bouchard looked great in this series. He's like, really coming into his own as a, a yes, top tier NHL defenseman. It, 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 it that was incredible, you know, and he like he's had a great series in his own right, especially on that power play when you've got the setup that they do with both of them with McDavid and Rice that'll both be in equally pass and shot threat, you know, and then all of a sudden somebody's just dropping it off to him and saying, you know, let go of the one timer. Yeah. This team is doing a really good job. And the Klim Costin pickup was a really great little pickup. Yeah. Uh, uh, now, now before we just keep going on the uh, Edmonton love fest here with yeah. this one and then the McDavid dry cycle show and all that, I give LA a lot of credit. You know, I had to see, I had the series going six, this was one of the ones I actually nailed to the game length and everything. I had it going six Me too. because I because I expected a fight, you know, and a lot of it looked a lot of it was the play of Jonas Corposalo. Like he was great. And Adrian Kempe was outstanding in this series. And, you know, every time just when you thought the team was dead, they crawled their way back into it. You know. That all really played out the way that. You know, it kind of played out the way I expected it to, but it was a hard fought series, and I appreciate that it was a hard fought series. Exactly, you know, physical and, series. And you know, like let's not forget these two teams met in the first round last year too, yep. and same, you know, same end result with Edmonton moving on. I think this might have been the nastiest series in the first round. Uh, it, it Dal- had- Dal- Dallas Minnesota gave it a run. But man, Edmonton LA was nasty. It had some major heat. Yeah, it had some major heat. Um, but what a fun series it was. And, you know, uh, yeah, I, look, I'm not surprised that Edmonton moved on, but I, I, I like the fight that was in there. And I think it's, you know, I think a series like that sets the tone for what's coming for who they have to play next. I mean, it really does. Yeah. And again, we've talked about it. You know, they, they will face Vegas in the second round. We'll get into those matchups a little bit later on. Uh, but I am so excited. I am so excited for the Western Conference kind of as a whole before we head over to the East here. Just kind of a little bit of an overview. We have Seattle, Dallas, and Vegas, Edmonton. And those are just going to be – it's going to be incredible hockey every night. And we're Mm -hmm. finally – we're at the point now. A lot of people love the first round, and I do too. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. (laughs) But the first round almost has a little bit too much hockey. And I, I say that just so, so sarcastically because there's no such it's, thing as too much hockey. It's, as, a, it's a workout as, on, you know. As we get into the second round, you really get to savor every single minute. Like You might have to double screen a little bit if something goes to overtime. But you really get to du- like to really savor every minute of every game from here on out. 
Yeah. And, and we have some really, really, really good matchups lined up. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, do we want to switch over to the the Eastern we, Conference? Yeah, we we will. Hit our matchups. Yeah, let me just t- touch on what you just said about like the yeah. amount of hockey and all that stuff like that. Because you're right. I mean, there comes a point, and and here's the thing too, the the first round. It's not just the you know. There's a lot go because it's a lot going on at one time, right? There's games but literally all- overlapping all night, every night. Right. Yeah. And so it's a bit. So not only is it a workout like within each individual night. But what happened when we were predicting these series also, and then what happened as it played out? Every series, except for Vegas, went six or longer. Yep. And when you get that many game sixes and then game sevens to go with it, because once you're looking at seven of them going game six, you know you're getting at least three, oh, you yeah. know, probably at least three or four that go game, game seven. Sevens. Yep. And that's what we had. We had three total, but, you know, none, you know, nonetheless, right? And, and, we're going to believe me because we're going to get into the part where Oof, some of the more surprising game sevens here. Well, not, no, not about the game sevens. We're going to oh, get into okay. the part where some of these game sixes were one bounce away from the other result and having a game seven. I mean, you had overtime in game six a couple of times. Yeah. You know, yeah, where, where it, go, where it can go the other direction really easily. One. So, bounce, and a couple of them were doing that. A couple of them were one bounce away. Like it, Oh, a couple um, of them were a couple of them were bounces. All right, we'll mm-hmm. get into that. Um, I think we've got to start. We have to start with the big story. We have to start with the biggest one. The best team in regular season history, not just losing in the first round, blowing, choking on a three-one series lead. Um. <laughs> the tears after game seven seem to indicate that that was Patrice Bergeron's last game. Um, if that is the case, it's a heartbreaking way for such a, a, a well-respected legend, first ballot Hall of Famer, to go out. Um, but Kevin, talk to me about how we got here. Uh, we, Like sure. I said, we have the best team in regular season history. They're up 3-1. Heading back to Boston to a rowdy TD Garden for Game Five, ready to close out the Panthers, and Sergey Borovsky comes into the net. Yeah, no kidding. Um, so here's 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 the thing with this because we we it's no secret on the show that this is probably the second most talked about team that we talk about on the show. You know, I, I honestly have talked about the Boston Bruins so many times that I feel like I've almost kind of become a bit of like an expert on them as well to an extent. So I have more notes on this series than any other series. And I have, I tweeted more about it after it was over than any other series. So through four games, wasn't this exactly what we expected? Wasn't it exactly what we thought it was going to be? You know, I'm sure, look, well, like, and I'm sure, look, there were, I'm sure there were people calling for a sweep. I get it. But Boston being up 3-1 after four was pretty much right on par, you know, and that's, that's the way I had it. I, I even last, last show, I even said it's going, I had it in, I had Boston in five and I said, don't be surprised if Florida wins an early game. Florida steals a game somewhere, right? Well, not even just steals it. I said, watch it be early. Yeah. And it was game two. So sure enough, you had like that game two. And, and what happens when they win a game? Like, especially early in the series, you start going. Oh, you know, okay. maybe they'll make like maybe they'll find a way to do something. And then taking and then game Bo- two in Boston, I think, right. is the, is the thing that matters. It, if it was game sure. three back at home with the crowd, blah blah blah, I think you read a little bit less into it. Right. But the fact that they snagged the game in Boston in that first pair, I think that really gave them some legs in the series. Well, and then when they when Boston goes on the road and wins the next two. Then you Looks start like to they go, cut the legs out right. from under them. Then you sit there and you go, well, now it really is going the way I thought it was going to go. Like, not just in the sense that, like, or now at least it really feels like it's probably over, right? And for me, after the after game four, they're up 3-1 in the series, and this is where everything changes. Because I look, I look at game five, and I see just punch, counter punch from both teams in terms of goals. But one key difference. Boston outshot Florida 43 to 22 in regulation. So when this thing goes to overtime, it feels like it's just a matter of time. Yep. And it really was because guess who dominated the start of that overtime? It was Boston. They were 
looking like they were getting ready to do, you know, to clinch this thing, seal it off. That's the way it is. And then Lena Solmark misplays the puck behind the net. Man. That is the series changing play right there. Once Florida survived that game five and won to extend the series to a game six, really even before then in game five, just getting it to overtime does this. They were playing with house money. A, a Boston goalie hasn't fallen from grace that quickly since Tuka Rask in the 2013 Cup Final. Ooh. Um, oh, got a good okay. one in there. Right? <laughs> but so anyway, no. So Florida was playing with house money at that point throughout game five because, and I tweeted something like this after the series was over. Getting records in the regular season is all well and good and it's exciting but it creates pressure in the playoffs. It doesn't mean that Boston, I'm not saying that to say that Boston was ill-equipped to handle the pressure of being in that spot in the playoffs. What it does mean is that after a while, though, you do have one team that goes completely carefree. They're just happy to be here at this point. And Matthew and Chuck said as much after game six. He said, we're, we're just having fun. There are there are no expectations. Yep. Nobody predicts that you're going to win the series. Nobody, you know, let alone that you're even you're not going to win the series. You're not going to win the cup. You have no expectations. You're literally happy to be there. And yep. and as you saw, when the losses start to pile up for Boston in Game Five, then Game Six, you're into Game Seven. Florida's got nothing to lose at that point. They've already pushed this thing farther than anybody ever anticipated they would. If nothing else. What was more impressive to me was after a frenetic third period, the Bruins tie it up. They have to come back to tie it up. They take the lead in game seven. You know, following the wild third Incredible. period that was game six, you know, yeah. and you got to uh, you got to five minutes left. And I'm going to sit here and tell you, I, I swear to you on my life. I was over watching the game at my in-laws. My wife is sitting in the same room as I am while the game is on. And there's, they get the TV timeout with 4.58 left. And I turn around and I said, I just got a funny feeling we're not done. Okay. It's not, this thing's not over yet. There's, you know, there's, you know, there's not more than five minutes left. And I'm just sitting here and, and, you know, sure enough, the net's empty at the end of the game. And here's the next part for me. This is how I know I'm watching way too damn much of stuff. Because the net's empty. They're trying to push for the tying goal. And I turn around, and again, I sit there, and, and I'm not commentating, but, like, I'm talking, you know. And my, my wife's there to hear it, so it's not like I'm talking to the wall. Right. But I sit there, and I even said, because so, they tried, I think they tried a play that kind of worked. It's, it worked it down low a little bit or something like that. And I turn around, and I go, that's what you want to do. Get the puck high and funnel it to the net. And 10 seconds later, Brandon Montour had it and scored. And I turn around and I like whipped her around. I said, see, what was I saying? <laughs> you know, I had one of those moments. And, you know, then real, you get to real, real yeah, quick. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned that 458 TV timeout because I said something during the same TV timeout to my wife. OK. And it ended up, ended up being about as prophetic as yours was. OK. What did you say? I said, if they lose this game like this, Bergeron retires. Well, yeah, and I we'll, think I think you know, given the results, it looked like he probably would was, was going to be done regardless. But I, we'll anyway. see. Yeah, we'll see how prophetic it is. But we're because we're not there yet. No, it looks it on. looks prophetic. It, no, I'm saying it the looks man prophetic. Was sobbing. Yeah, we'll get to it. Sobbing. We, we will get to that. Um, but then then the finish, right? Because Boston. The, the Bruins, the fans in the building were shell shocked after Stunned. that. I mean, Carter Verhage is the overtime they, hero. They didn't know what even hit them. And Florida had three or four just brilliant looks before Carter Verhage gets the winner. Like, Verhage had one of them to begin with. He had a great look at the front of the net. That came after, of all people. And it was funny because, again, almost, almost prophetic. I tweeted right before the overtime started, you know, it would be pretty poetic. Like, like you, you're looking for an OT hero at that point, right? You're like, and I'm not doing it in the Butcher Grass OT challenge style. I'm not doing that like completely, but I turned around. I even said it would be pretty poetic if Patrice Bergeron got another game seven yeah. OT winner in this spot, you know, given the, like, especially for where it's at, right? Like this thing's been pushed to the limit at this point. Boston's 
kind of on their heels. It's their, you know, they just got stunned by the fact that it's tied with a minute to go. Wouldn't it be something if he scored another game seven OT winner? That would be pretty cool, right? And then I sat there, and the next thing that I said when it came, I said, as for Florida, we've played 60 minutes, and Matthew Kachuk doesn't have a shot on goal yet. Yep. And who got the breakaway not two minutes in? I thought Matt, he ended it. And I, I really thought he was did. going yep. in to score. Uh, also worth noting in this game, uh, we mentioned – Linus Allmark making a, a pretty critical error in overtime of game five. Mm -hmm. He did also start game six and did not look particularly great, which led to uh, Jeremy Swayman getting the start in game six. So, so it's funny because this is the next note I have down about this series. Because the one thing I'll say from the Boston side on this. So, uh, well, let's start with this. So Swayman's got to start six well, in start, hindsight, right? Ooh, ooh. No, I, it's not that I don't start Allmark there. I have a different theory for this. I don't. I think that the way that they handled Allmark in the series, it really bothered me. When you're starting to get to the point where game two is getting out of hand, you got to get him out of there. Okay. I have no problem with him starting consistently throughout. I have no problem with you going back to him in game three after you lose game two. and Because then, then in game three and game four, you look like a genius. He wins both games and looks fine. Right. Right. So you look like you look like a genius for going back to him, but I would have gotten him out of there when game two looks like like it's obvious game two is not going your way. Get him I, out. I'm right? surprised we didn't see Swayman in game three. Not because they don't trust Allmark, not because blah blah blah, just because that's what they did all season. Like I, I know Linus Allmark's probably gonna win the Vezina, might get some serious heart voting, you know, etc. But it really was a tandem. I, this was sure. the first time, I believe it was the first time all season that Allmark started six games in a row. Well, yes, it definitely is. And here, so here's, here's the you second You don't want part. that to be in the playoffs. Sure. Well, and here's, here's the second part for me. Because, again, you know, he makes the mistake in game five in overtime. I got no problem coming back to him in game six. Here's where I do have a problem. The third period of game six is chaos. Total mass Insanity. chaos. Insanity. I think that either when they tied the game back up at four or when they get the fifth one to tie it back up, one of those two, you got to get him out of there. Because he looks, every time they scored a goal, he looks like he's getting up as if he's in pain. Yep. So he looks spent. Get him out of there. He certainly doesn't look 100%. And, not anywhere close to it. And, and, and honestly, I'm not even sitting here, I'm not trying to sit here and say make the change to go, you know, Oh, it's 4-4. Four, four. Make the change because he's playing bad. No, make the change because your team needs to wake up here. You're screwing around with game six. You could win this thing. Yep. And you're screwing around with it. And rather than let him just eat the end res like, in, in, like instead of like pull him, instead of letting him eat the end result of game six and be in there for all 60, you know, roughly. I mean, a little bit that he was out for the empty net, but you right. get the point. Just to then turn to the other goalie in Game 7, the guy who had only seen one shot on goal in the entire series. And yep. why? Because he had to come in because Olmark got kicked out of a game for trying to fight for trying somebody. To, for trying to fight Matthew, fight Kachuk, Matthew Kachuk after yes. he was very clearly rattled because he was playing poorly. Sure. Like that, well, that, it should have been a bigger indicator to you that he was trying to fight Matthew Kachuk than anything. Sure. And uh, listen... I'm having a big discussion here about the goaltending thing of this. Yeah. I'm going to tell you the real reason that they lost this series. Because for three, well, it happened in game two also when they lost, but really for the final three. And Olmark's giveaway is just a part of this. Their puck management was horrible. As bad as I have seen it all year. The, the team that looked Horrendous. like a well-oiled machine all year long, all of a sudden couldn't string together passes. They were struggling. And... Yep. Like, all, all you need to know is go look at Matthew Kachuk's first goal in game six. Look at that turnover. Yep. They didn't do that all year. And now all of a sudden in the playoffs, that's what's creeping up on you. Now, I have, um, I have, a, I do have a question for you out of all of this. And oh, by the way, this, okay. I had, to, I had two, I had, so that the goaltending thing was my, was one of my things. But my second thing on the Boston side of this whole thing was this. Is it Bergeron? It is about Bergeron. Okay. Because look, because I wanted to talk about that too. Sure. Because look, Boston has been a city with an embarrassment of riches in the sports world for over two decades. I am not at all trying to like, and I'm not trying to dump on them here oh, by saying, and like, by saying just, that. And just in full F Boston, like absolutely oh, no, like, from, from, but like, especially and here, the Celtics and, and, and here's the thing from where we are from, 
you get tired of watching the repeat act, right? But here's like I understand it. By the way, Sixers and four. Anyway, the Sixers kept the uh, vibes going in TD Garden. Uh, that's what I'm tonight, saying. By the way, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Um, anyway, um, but I understand why it happens when you get cornerstone players and you build teams the right way and you play consistently and you always seem to have someone who's among the best of the best on your roster at all times, like. Like and I'm and I'm not talking just the Bruins here. I'm talking about the every team in the city for as long as we feel like we can remember for the last 20 years has always had cornerstone players, been built the right way, had one of the best guys in the sport all the time, right? Yep. Which is why watching Patrice Bergeron after the game and the emotion that he had, you know that this could be it. And, it looks like it probably is, right. frankly. And Patrice Bergeron, like, and I've said this before, Patrice Bergeron's a surefire first ballot Hall of Famer, won a cup in 2011, made two more appearances in the final, all the Selkie wins. There's nothing more Gold that medalist. he could... Right, there's nothing more he could accomplish that wouldn't be a repeat act, right? Yep. And yet, for as special as 2011 and 2013 and 2019 certainly were, this might have been the most special season he's ever gone through. Maybe. What they well, accomplished leading up to this point. Well, and I did also. And, there's, well, and from that, there's this voice in your mind that's just saying, this isn't how it ends, is it? Like, it can't be how it ends. Well, and something worth mentioning on the Bergeron front here is, so he did not play in the first five games of this series. Um, and the reason he did not is because he suffered an injury in the last game of the regular season against Montreal. Now, why was he playing in that game, you might ask? And I think part yeah, of the reason... This is important. Right. And I think part of the reason is probably because he knew that this might be his last round and he wanted to play near home again. At home. Um, I think yep. that was part of it. But also his dad is sick. Yep. And he wanted to play in front of his father. Um, he doesn't know if his father will be around to see him play again. Mm -hmm. So it was important to Patrice Bergeron to play in game 82 after the win record was already locked up in a game that didn't mean anything. And that really goes a long way to show you about the kind of player and the kind of person that Patrice Bergeron is. Yeah. Um, because he could have very easily... You know, when we when we look back at Patrice Bergeron's career in, in 20 years with some hindsight here, everyone's going to remember the punctured lung in the Stanley Cup final. That's that's the big flashy story. Mm -hmm. But this is the most Patrice Bergeron story that, that could ever happen. And um, the team looked OK without him. You know, we talked about the fact that they did win three of those first four games, you know, without Patrice Bergeron and. He wasn't the reason that they lost. Like when he came back, he was not a detriment to the lineup. He was not, you know, the reason that they lost. But he was definitely not a hundred percent. And it's it would be interesting to know, you know, if if he was in game five, do they win that game? You know, I think that's the big what if for Boston fans um, surrounding the the Patrice Bergeron injury situation. But that being said, it's. I don't think he would change it. I don't think he would go back and unplay nah, the game in Montreal. No, nah, he wouldn't change anything. No. He's got. It. He's probably one of the biggest no regrets guys out there to begin with. the The emotion was look because the emotion was there the whole time that they're leaving the ice, but it really hit when it's Marshand because it's that's the guy who you've gone to that's battle with deal. forever. Yeah, you know. And I'm sure Krejci was right there, too, kind of in a similar vein. Yeah, yeah. As far as the emotion between them. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. I know. And yeah. the thing the thing about Bergeron, is, you know, there's there's plenty. You know, and I'm not getting into a big rant about this, but, like, there's plenty that's wrong with hockey culture. We've seen it over the years. This is a good – this is one of the good guys. This is just a guy who goes out and plays and just loves to play. I don't and think it's, anyone has ever said a bad word about Patrice Bergeron how as can a person. You? The or guy just a is a good player. friggin' hockey player. Yep. He's just a really good friggin' hockey player. And he's a point and, of goal game. He's a point of goal guy who they're gonna name the defensive trophy afterward after he retires. Like how do you really like practically? They should. Every coach in the entire league, or every coach 
coaching any kid 10 or younger is trying to make 20 Patrice Bergeron's. Like, he he's the perfect hockey player. Well, because yeah, because he's a model centerman, you know, he carries himself incredibly well. And and while we're at it, the guy's never gonna have like the guy can live in Boston for the rest of his life, be around the Boston Bruins forever. If he if he does hang them up playing wise, he can hang around the Bruins forever and never buy a drink in the city ever again no. because he's that he was that. And you know. the second he does decide to hang him up, thirty seven going into the rafters. One hundred percent. I mean, <laughs> I'm convinced they're waiting for him to retire so they can put, they, so they can start putting teams from that eleven cup in. I mean, him and Marchand are the only I, ones left. Like the Bruins aren't retiring Tyler Sagan's number. So, <laughs> I mean, did they, they, they do Char's number already? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think because I, I think don't that think retirement's so. too fresh. But Char's number's getting retired. Though. Oh, absolutely. But I think they're waiting for Bergeron. That's what I mean. But. All right. Yeah, um, but, the, but I think it would like I just don't know if you're gonna. That's fair. Um, you know, I don't know if you're gonna do that right away, completely or whatever. Um, right. Oh man, this this game's getting wild. Sorry, I, we're we're no, watching I know, during I'm this looking, Rangers Devils game, and it, hey, look, it's I, Jacob Truba. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm I'm try, I'm looking to see if, if I don't know. Okay, it's not who I thought it was initially. Okay, it's not I was Jack making, Hughes. It's Timo Meyer instead, okay. but Timo Meyer yeah, just looked like Timo look Meyer like just looked like much. Eric Lindros, and, and I'm pretty sure Trouba is going to look like Scott. Oh Stevens my god! It actually it's replay. almost identical. Is it really? Yes, okay, it I'm is. I'm seeing the replay now. Give me a second. Tell me that's not almost identical. Man, that's the same hit. It's wow. the same cross center ice, almost into the into the offensive zone. Yeah, he put his head down for half a second. Wow. Look at this. And there's no, I mean, what what else are you supposed to do? Devils fans are used to seeing this hit in this building. In this building, too. Yeah, really. Man. Oh. God. No, it wasn't, no, no, no. That was in the center. That was in, that was in Philly. Well, I just mean, I just mean oh. it's the building. It's Scott Stevens. It, it building. was Scott Stevens building. Yes. Um, so we are still working our way towards this matchup. Uh, we got some time left in this game. <laughs> Uh, but meanwhile, it's, is there anything else you wanted to say on Florida, uh, Boston, or do we want to start talking about who they're going to go up against? We can probably we can probably start moving on. I'm sorry, I'm okay. tweeting something. I'm tweeting something about that. Yeah. So the big story here is the Boston Bruins blowing the President's Trophy in the best regular season in history and going down in the first round. But quite frankly, I think the second biggest story is that the streak is broken <laughs> for the first time. Since 2004, the Toronto Maple Leafs win a round. They defeat the Tampa Bay Lightning in six games, in overtime of game six, in a series that... So it started out as a really good series. (laughs) Okay, it started out as a really good series. And I know Tampa won game five. But games four, five, and six, it felt like they were running out of gas. To me, game four was the the last competitive game of that series. And and f- Toronto winning that game, it, it just seemed pretty inevitable. Like, yes, I know we make the jokes about Toronto blowing it and blah, blah, blah. And if they had lost game six, it certainly wouldn't have been as inevitable as I'm making it sound now. But... They were just the better team. I, Florida, Tampa looks so tired. They've played so much hockey over the last five years. Yeah, I think it finally just caught up to them. And, and John Cooper just, just has finally run out of horse to beat. Like he's gotten all he can out of this group for now. It's the it's the horse that's out of gas on the home stretch. There, that's. I mean, he just can't whip it anymore. I don't disagree with you that. They it looked like they ran out of gas. I don't think it was non competitive down the stretch. No, as I much agree. As you're saying like I like I I think, I mean let's put it this way that this is this is exactly where we're starting this whole thing with the, you're one bounce away in game six from game and, seven. And, and for the record, I don't mean to imply that Tampa gave up. It oh no, you didn't imply like you didn't were, imply it. It's just they, it just seemed like they were a step this. behind. They were a step slow. They were they were giving their all. They just didn't quite have it. They just came up a little bit short. The thing is, is that this is, it was just a weird series 
I mean, I guess first of all, initial reaction. Finally, it's over. The first round draft here misses. The longest running joke in hockey yeah, is all the over. fan reactions were some good ones. Um, now I, we talked. No, we talked last last show because I had said I was starting to do some stuff on Instagram and whatever, yeah. you know, all that type of stuff. I put a little video clip after this game in particular, or after the series was over, the Toronto series, because. Who scored the game-winning goal in Game 6? John Tavares. And it had been 19 years since they had made it out of the first round, and he scored in overtime to win a game 2-1 to one in yep. Game 6, just like he did seven years ago to win Game 6, 2-1 to one in overtime for the New York Islanders who hadn't won a playoff series in 23 years. Yep. Funny how history repeats itself. Well, there's one more drought that Leafs fans are hoping John Tavares gets a chance to break. Oh, for sure. So this this is really for the core group of this team. You know, Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner, Morgan Riley, who had a brilliant series offensively, just seemed like every time he touched the puck, he did something, you know, to change the kind of change the outcome. Um, William Nylander. Tavares, these are the ones that have been around for you. I mean, Tavares is actually probably still the newcomer of that whole group in a way, but still been around for long enough, right? Um, the reactions you saw from Sheldon Keefe and Kyle Dubas, that's the weight that this carries. Kyle not, Dubas reacted like a man who saved his job. Not <laughs> Well, right. Who gets to not, stay in Toronto. Not his just contract's for the, up. But that's you know. exactly what I have written down. Not just for the city of Toronto, the Leafs franchise, and the players on the team, but for themselves. Their jobs were on the line here. And, and Kyle Dubas' contract is coming up. Not oh, yeah. only is he re-signing, he's now getting paid. <laughs> And the further they go, the more he's going to get paid. Uh, so what was better? Uh, Jason Spezza slamming the table after the overtime win in Game 5. <laughs> uh, Kyle Dubas chirping uh, Tampa, fans Tampa fans in Game 4. Or Kyle Dubas turning bright purple after they won in Game Six because he just screamed for about two and a half minutes straight. Because <laughs> we got some really good clips out of that box over the course of this series. I'm not even going to go to that box for my favorite reaction. My favorite reaction was the airtime that Sheldon Keith got off the bench. Just you know, same thing. Knowing he just saved his job. That's fair. Um, um, yeah. Did you uh, did you see the dangle reaction? Of course I did. Just pure screaming. Just um, pure well, screaming. here's the thing. I didn't even. So I went back to watch LFR for a sec because I wanted to see his LFR. To st- yeah, you know, it, it was a great. It was a great because, LFR. Because as we've done, yeah. like, come on, that that's part of the longest running joke in hockey was when it was over. You went to go find that reaction. Oh, absolutely. But eventually, I also caught the in game the watch a, watch a leaf game with dangle whole thing. And got that reaction as well. The in the moment, just pure reaction of, oh my that, goodness, it went in. That man was trying really, really hard not to cry on a national yes. stream. Yep. You're right. And he was definitely crying. He was just trying really hard not to visibly cry. Right. Um, now, and, and that's the thing, right? Like, But that's the whole thing about the series, right? This was probably the most compelling series of the first round. Not for the storyline of Toronto possibly winning it, but for how close it was. You have you have games one and two that aren't close at all, no. but each team gets one, so it keeps the series close, and it's a battle through two games. Then you get game three, and this is really, this is how close the series was. You get game three, Tampa's up a goal with two minutes left, and Toronto ties it with one minute to go, wins in overtime. Game four, Tampa's up four to one. It's halfway through the third period. And they lose that lead too. That's and Toronto game. wins again in overtime. That's the game. Toronto could have won game six. It was close to being the same situation of rally back to force overtime. So it was really close to that. Or game five, sorry. That's what I'm saying. They could have won yeah. game five. Yeah. And then you get the two to one fight to the finish in game six, you know, that takes that goal, just a turnaround shot off of skate into the net it's not the pretty it's not going to be the prettiest goal on the highlight reel but they all count the same 
and just you know but just a brilliant series between these two i mean you know why game four was the game what's that it was four one it was four one in the third period and tampa broke that they (laughs) took their foot off the pedal and the Leafs finally finally started having some success. They started flipping that little wrist shot on from the point that we saw, you know, we heard uh, Derek Lalonde talking about. And they made the Tampa Bay Lightning and to an extent Andre Vasilevsky look human. Well, and this goes back to my point about the core, though, too. When you need it the most, that like, who took over in the spot when, like, before it's even a game the, again? The two goals in game six, Austin Matthews, John Tavares. And that's not even where I'm going with that because I'm going right. game. I'm going game okay, four. Okay. They're, they're down four one. You need you need a goal, Austin Matthews. Austin you Matthews. get a power. You yeah. get a power play right after it. You need another goal. This is a must score situation for you, or you're gonna. This is a tie. Guess theory, what? Right? It's Austin Matthews Guess what? again. It's Austin Matthews again. And then Morgan Riley, like I said, every time he touched it, it felt like big goal. And then, and then here comes the crazy part. It's all the core guys. It's Matthews. It's Riley. You know, Marner is setting up plays. Tavares is in, involved in this. You know, they, they, this is what they forget. You know, this isn't even part of the regular core per se, but who tied up game three? What This is what you went out and got Ryan O'Reilly for, right? Yep. That's what you, that's the whole reason you went out and got him was to get somebody who could and come man, up in those moments. He was great. And, and who scored the game winner in game four, though? Deflection by Alex Kerfoot. There's the depth. Yep. There's, you know, there's the, you know, the maybe not the unexpected hero. Um, College edition Matthew Nyes has looked great since he's come in. Yeah, they got they got a winner in that one. Oh I mean, yeah, full blown. It is he is an, a real guy. He's going to be in their middle six probably for the next couple of years, and yeah, he's an asset for sure. And they're going to move on yeah. in the second round, and they don't have to face the best regular season team in history. They face the loss of the Florida Panthers. There's t- and, and 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 you know what like and I'm not trying to make again we're not quite onto the preview portion of this yet but I don't want to I want to say this here because there's an element like it, it kind of goes both ways because they could have had it like th- this is demon number one and then the Bruins have been a part of the demons for so much of it that it could have been another whole could have been poetic the story it kind of yeah. could have been poetic that they, that those two would have faced off against each other but really. You know, it it doesn't matter. I mean, let's put it this way: Do you think Florida, like Florida, is going to go? Toronto cares. Well, Toronto doesn't care, and Florida's going to go in thinking the same thing that everybody's going to sit there and, because here's the thing: What is going to happen now? And I'm not again. We're not going to make the prediction part yet, but everybody's going to sit there and say, "Well, this is look. Toronto got over the hump of the first round for the first time, and now look, they don't even have to play Boston for it. So they're going they're going to do it right. Conference final time, right? And Florida's just going to sit there and go." Keep not believing. Keep saying keep, that. Keep calling us underdogs. Yep. You know? I agree. And it's going to be very interesting, and we will uh, talk about that matchup in just a minute. Uh, we do have one more first round one more first round matchup that's concluded. Obviously, you know, we are still recording here during uh, the end of Devils Rangers. The Devils are Which is why we're kind of stalling a little yeah, bit. Yeah, sometimes we're and sometimes we're watching the game, to be honest, but we are paying attention. Well, I'm here. sorry, but like the the hit that was the the Trubo Man. on Meyer hit. I was more talking about Shesterkin going end oh, over end Sh- Sh- yeah, about Shesterkin a minute and a half taken, before that. Right, getting taken off his feet by uh, yeah, getting this, knocked down. Regardless of how this series ends, and you know, da- uh, the Devils are up two nothing with a little less than ten minutes to go. Right. Uh, this will carry into next season. Like this is nasty. Oh yeah. These two teams. This it's is like, one of those. It's, re- it's renewed now. That's this is absolutely. Great. This you, you is look, one of those uh, hate is born in the playoffs kind of series. Well, this is what, and this is what's great about like actually this. This is kind of a nice segue from the Leafs series too, because the Leafs and Lightning have already played each other in the playoffs multiple times. So coming into this one, you knew the same thing. Like it's kind of why John Cooper throughout the whole thing was, you know, I, I, like I said, he's got kind of lawyer like answers. Oh, he was for playing everything. games in the media, the entire series, but there's an element of it where, you know what? He's sitting here going, you think I don't know anything about this team. How many years in a row have we played them in the playoffs? Yep. Right? Like you think I don't know. Absolutely. Uh, so the one series we do have remaining here to talk about that is complete. 
The Carolina Hurricanes uh, kind of just ground out the, the New York Islanders. Uh, yeah. it, it did take six. Um, there was some overtime involved, too. There sure was. No one's really all that surprised by that. You know, we knew these were two pretty defensively stout teams. Mm-hmm. And that is kind of what we got. And uh, I think the biggest surprise for a lot of people was uh, the success of Carolina's offense. Uh, people kind of doubted their ability to score, you know, four and four and up goals in a game. Uh, and they showed the ability to do that. And they showed the ability to, to put pucks by Sorokin. And I mean, that's all it takes. You know, when you rely on your defense and he gives up uh, four goals in this in game two, five goals in game four. You know, the rest of them were all tight, but right, that's enough to make the difference. Sure, and well, and I think the key, I think one of the keys to what you're talking about is, you know, like for a team that didn't have Andrei Svechnikov, kind of where was the offense going to come from? Right beyond beyond the obvious. I mean, like I'm not trying like Sebastian Ajo is obviously a great offensive player, but I but I think people looked and were like, hey, you know what? You just took one of their top three offensive players out of yeah. the whole uh, thing. What S- happened Sebastian, now? Sebastian Ajo is elite offensively. Uh, uh, Andrei Svechnikov is an elite goal scorer, and there's a difference, right? He's he's the guy that puts the biscuit in the basket, and without him, you know, you're worried about who's stepping up. Right. Um, you know, so I guess let me give my kind of primer on, like, I'll go with the Islander side, and then I'll go to the Carolina side, because we're going to talk more about Carolina as we move into the future of some of these yeah. series. You know, because Carolina, like we already said, it, Carolina's play is rooted in defense, and the Islanders really have gone to the well with the same group a lot. You know, they added they added Bo Horvat this year, but in the years that they've made playoff runs recently, it's been the same group for the most part. It you know, and it feels like this is gonna and this is gonna sound a little Winnipeg of of them. It feels like they've come about as far as they can go with this current group. The bottom six is really past their prime. The defense could probably use some upgrades. They've got a lot of stuff to figure out. I mean, when you look at the bot, like consider guys in the bottom six and realize that you're running out in their thirties. Zach Parise, Kyle Palmieri, Matt Martin, Casey Sezikis, Cal Clutterbuck. Like something's probably got to give with that a little bit. Like, like you can build around Barzil, and I think Nelson's obviously a valuable piece. Like Nelson stepped up when nobody else was even really like kind of not not nobody was there, but wasn't really there. And Horvat's gonna be there now. But again, he's, years. but again, he's like teetering on that line of like being one of the older guys. So that's a little bit of a question mark yeah, going but forward. With that, with that contract kicking in next year, you kind of got to make that one work. Well, they're go- no, they're going to have to make it work. It's just yeah. he's teetering on that grouping, and ne- like you don't need to add any more pieces. That you need to shed some of that. They're in a precarious position, and it'll be interesting to see how you know eighty-year-old Lou Lamorello decides he wants to handle that. Or if he wants to handle that, it's it's very interesting. Um, we all knew that they were missing kind of the offensive talent, and you add Bo Horvat, and that's that's all well and good. He's a he's a really good player, but it's just not enough. You know, you can't rely on Matthew Barzil and Bo Horvat to score all of your goals. Nah, exactly. And you know, like I'm like I went in and I just looked right now, so. Brock Nelson had five points in the series. Kyle Palmieri ended up with five points in the series. Barzil kind of picked it up late. Like Barzil didn't even have, I don't think he had a point until game five, right? Like that's uh, when he, that, like that. That's when he yeah. finally scored his first couple goals. You can't have your big trade deadline acquisition who you then commit to and sign come away in a six game series with a goal and an assist. It's, it's a bad look. It can't happen. And Th- At a that's... certain point, it's now been two years, and you've replaced the coach. Yeah, I wonder. I mean, if look, you've little... got you've got a goaltender, you've got a forward who is worth building around, and you know, and and, and I think I think that you can. You've still got young pieces. You've got Noah Dobson. You've well, that's got, where I was going know... with it. I I just don't the the thing I don't know yet with Dobson is it's not clear cut that he's that level. He might, be, he might be a really nice middle pair defenseman by the end of the thing. 
But he I reminds, he reminds me a lot of Ivan Provorov. He's got the top end talent, but is he going to be able to kind of show that full time? The thing is, is that, that he's never playing in those top end situations, though. They kind of keep him sheltered and okay. that works out for him a little bit. But what happened? Like, again, I think that you can't let him like you can't protect him on the third pairing forever. And you can't also just keep rolling out. Pellick, Pollock, Mayfield, and, and expect and ex- expect a bunch of big changes. It's not going to happen. This is as sure. good as it gets, I think. Yep. And so a lot of this team is locked in. So. Yeah. So let's go to the Carolina side of it then, because yeah. And look, I already said a little bit. Sebastian Ajo is you know is a great player. He really led the way in this series. I mean, he he emerged superior in the battle of the Sebastian Ajos. <laughs> that's true. You want to go to? I mean, you want to go look for a playoff hockey type of play. Take a puck off the face that goes into your own <sighs> net, no less, basically, and go get a, go get stitches. Come back and then score. Yep. You know, that's what happens in the playoffs, right? Absolutely. Uh, second bravest comeback of the playoffs. Number one being uh, Morgan Barron. Took a skate yeah, to the is... face, 75 stitches. If you haven't looked it up, it's nasty. Anyway, uh, but yes, skate that's to the picture face. picture of a hockey player in the play. Oh, yeah. But Ajo takes a face right to the mush. Brock Nelson, by the way, beautiful hand-eye coordination, batting it into the net straight out of the air. One of the most oh, yeah. impressive things I've ever seen a hockey player do, to be honest. Uh, but it feels really awful. There were a couple of goals off the face in this first round. Zach Hyman <laughs> scored one, too. Yeah, I know. Um, um, but either way... You... You already kind of touched on it with Carolina, though, that how many guys were kind of pitching in because they like they have a bunch of guys who are certainly not superstars, but find a way to chip in. Yeah. And 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 like the superstar or, or the not quite superstars I'm talking about, and they very well may eventually become more of a star player type. But like Seth Jarvis had a really good series. Martin yes, very had, had, been great. had a had a Kotkaniemi strong series been great. and kind of and they'll kind of but. But think about this for a second. You're Jesper also Fast. well. This that's where I was going. You're also yep. hearing Stefan Nason, Jesper Fast, Paul Stastny. They lose Tavo Teravine and during the series. Yep. And you know, you, like and like I said, with Jarvis and Nakash, they're just they're going to be really solid players for years to come. The defense was really on point, pretty much across the board. I mean, I don't really recall big flaws. You know, Burns and and um, Jacob Slavin, and you know you're watching. You're watching as a third pairing of what was it? Uh, Jesse Chatfield and Shane Gostisbehere are doing things too. Shane Gostisbehere excelling on this team. Just uh, it's, you knew it it's, was going to happen, though. Yeah. It's Rod. It's Rod Brindamore rooted in defense and getting the most and out battle. of the player. Yep. Root, it's rooted in defense and battle. That's all that it is. And, and their pen and their penalty killing in this series was lights out. And by the way. If you've never watched playoff hockey before, specifically <laughs> Carolina Hurricanes playoff hockey, there is not a single coach in the league that's more entertaining come the postseason than <laughs> Rod Brendamore. Because he is, first of all, the man's lips are, stick out past his nose. He's the most expressive man on the face of the planet <laughs> when he gets those big old lips going. He just... When he looks unpleasant, he looks so unpleasant that you don't want to talk to him. Um, and Lord knows you don't want to fight him because the man is in <laughs> ridiculous shape. Have you seen um, like Have you seen clips stupid. of like it's of, of like them on road trips or whatever? And he's up at like five thirty in the morning doing his own workout first before he's in better shape than half the players. Like, sure, he is. If he ever plays in an alumni event, he's taking heads off. <laughs> Hundred percent. But regardless, this is like this is a really well built team. It's a really well coached team. Obviously, it's it's the We've kind said- of, it's the kind of team. So okay, losing a superstar always is always gonna hurt. If if Mitch Marner goes down for Toronto, they're a worse team. If Jack Hughes goes down for the Devils, they're a worse team. If pick if you know Leon Drysaddle goes down for the Oilers, they're a worse team. Pick your team. But out of all the teams in the league, based on the depth of the rest of their team as well as the system they play, I'm not sure there's a franchise better built to withstand the loss of a superstar than the Carolina Hurricanes. Um, and they really showed that in this series because right. their depth was excellent, their goaltending was excellent, their defense was excellent. 
And this they is all stuff. They didn't need Andrei Svechnikov. Like, yes, it would have been great, and obviously it would have made it a little easier, but they won cleanly without him. It's, and yeah, I mean, and we've the thing is, is we've said all of these things before about this team. For the last three or you know, four years, to be honest. But, but the playoffs is where you really step up and show it. That yep. you know, I don't want to make it seem like the Islanders didn't give them a battle. I mean, you're in a, again, same thing. No. You're in a game. You're in a game six, and one bounce is going to send this thing to game seven. So good for them for fine for getting the bounce and winning. Because again, it was another kind of crazy goal. It was a turnover. Throw it from a bad angle. <laughs> And, you know, throw it from a bad angle and see what happened. And, and for the, the, the real shame of it was Ilya Sorokin, who had played brilliantly throughout the series, was real, really the Islanders' best player for a lot of it. Yeah. It probably lets in one that he stops 99% of the time and kind of, you know, well, it, because, you know, it, it was the it's kind of Leighton esque, if you will. It was from an angle and it was off the pads and it goes right through the wickets and. It's that kind of goal, but that's how it goes sometimes. And if and you you gotta you know you gotta take of all things too. By the way, a Paul Stastny goal assisted by Derek Stepan off a turnover. Yep. What year are we in? Uh, you know, like, this is the same thing as Tyler Sagan scoring all those goals for Dallas too. It's like what year is this? Fair enough. Uh, but unfortunately, the Islanders do fall. The Carolina Hurricanes move on and. The team that it certainly looks like they're going to face. Uh, there's about three minutes left in this Game 7 as we're recording here. The New Jersey Devils have just scored into the empty net to go up 4 or nothing. I think uh, we can. I think we're it, safe. So, so this series, man, I said that Edmonton LA was the nastiest series in the playoffs, and I do stand by that. <laughs> man, this one might be close. This series has been mean. This This series feels like... Uh, two teams that you know are thirty miles from each other, or whatever the gap is. Like it, this, yeah. You know the Rangers win the first two on the road, and I'll be honest, I was fully expecting them to walk through. They they came mm-hmm. in and they looked, they looked like they were gonna big brother the New Jersey Devils so, and win and win in four or five. What a weird series this has been. Because, and I say this because. It is the third goal. It's the third series in this playoffs with three different situations of a goalie switch. All three played out differently. All three played out to massively different results. This one clearly played out the best. Akira Schmid was absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. In game three, in game four, in game five, and in game seven. Well, and and here's the, and here's the reasoning behind it because or not the reasoning, but here's this is the reason behind the way the series goes the way that it kind of does because the Rangers outscored the Devils in the first two games ten to two, and then the Rangers score one one zero, and okay, game six they get kind of back on it and score five, yep. and in another two minutes, unless you know, it may be, maybe maybe uh, don't you dare say it, Rangers fans will be coming after us, or Devils fans will be coming after us for months. <laughs> well, but you get the point. <laughs> you get the point for where everything currently yes. is. And regardless, like, they're still going to win the game. Exactly. It won't be more than one. But you're right. No, you're right. The first two, the first two games and the way that went, I, I had them on. The, like, they were on the ropes. I it had the Devils like t- on the ropes. It looked like a team that made the Eastern Conference Finals last year versus a team that hadn't made the playoffs since Taylor Hall was there. And that's what it was. Right. And it's fully, like, yes, the team rallied around them, but it is fully a Kirish Mead. He is, coming out of the first round, he is my early Conn Smythe vote. If you're talking about across the eight series, Um, he has to be the player that's had the single biggest impact on turning a series around. He definitely had a big impact. I'm just trying to think of... And then the numbers he put up, like take out game six, his his goals against is below zero, uh, below one. I just significantly want, below one. I just wonder, like the issue that I'm gonna have with this is okay. He definitely did it in the Rangers series. N- you know, you face a totally new team, things can change. You know, I so I don't know yet. You That's know what fair. I mean? Like I just don't know if it's gonna carry for that long because you can. Ar- there's plenty of players you can argue are most valuable to their team. That's fair. 
and well, could still be over, you know, whatever. So let's start talking about the second round matchups. And I think uh, I think we double back. I think we start. No, but by the way, where we are. But by the way, okay. so real real quick, because I don't want to just gloss over like the Rangers yeah, yeah. portion of this uh, yeah. and all that stuff like that, because it's um, like, man, just yeah, it's really disappointing. I. Yeah. I'm going to make a prediction right now, and it's not really an out of the, you know, it's not really going out on a limb here. Because I've seen it a lot. Oh, yeah. I think yeah. I think he's fired after this. When you add, add, pure add with minimal reduction from your roster, Patrick Kane and Vladimir Tarasenko, and you go out in the first round, somebody's got to get fired. And it's... It, I don't think anybody made a mistake necessarily. I mean, you can make some arguments about things Gerard Gallant did in the series and, you know, certain decisions he made. But as far as, you know, the the front office goes, I think you acquire these players a hundred times out of a hundred when, when they become available. Like, I don't think, I don't think you redo any decisions that the front office made during the year. It's just unfortunate that, you know, you couldn't get it done in, in the postseason. Which exactly, and it's you know, it it's just always like playoff series. You can't give teams life. You just can't give teams new life. And you're you're sitting. And this is another one of those bounce games because you're in an overtime in game three, and the Rangers can make it three zero in the series, and it's a way closer game this time. And the Rangers are at home, too, so they win two games on the road and then go home and watch it all deteriorate from there. It, you know, and I can officially say it now. Shut out. Yep. Shut, out shut, shut out, out, shut out, shut out, shut out, shut out. Akira Schmidt with a game seven shut out to eliminate the New York Rangers, and just like that, thousands of Akira Schmidt jer- jerseys sell. <laughs> That's incredible, but that's insanely impressive. Is it, no, is it not incredible? One 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 zero five zero. Incredible. Seven goals. Out- seven goals in five games will do it. You know. I, yeah, and it's not even that. Not really. It's two goals no, it's in two four goals games. Two goals in four that you didn't with win. one bad game dispersed in there. Yeah. And, wow. Yeah, but all right. Uh, with that being said, let's like I said, let's bounce on to some predictions here, and let's let's start here in the metro. Okay. Let's uh, bring because this up. Devils Hurricanes. Now, we talked about the Hurricanes being a tough defensive team, and obviously we are asking for instant feedback. You know, this Devils game, we're literally talking during the handshake line. <laughs> um, so, for the record, you know, if you're looking for your quickest analysis, you got it live here right on You Would Think. So make sure to you know, subscribe on <laughs> Subscribe on YouTube and follow us on Twitter at YWT well, we're Podcast. Gi- we're giving our quickest analysis immediately after the game's over. It won't be heard <laughs> until the morning, probably. But um, <laughs> but regardless, so we have the Devils who uh, will be going on the road. Game one will be in Raleigh. Yep. Man, I, I it's hard given where we're at, given the the postseason and the fact that Carolina has this stalwart defense and. It seems like they've kind of got it running on all cylinders right now. It's really hard to pick against Carolina Hurricanes here. I don't know what you think. I mean, this is an interesting one. Uh, I, the thing I don't I think about this is New, New Jersey can't afford to fall behind in this series because Carolina is going to be way more careful about. If you give them two games like you give the Rangers, pack your bags. Exactly. And, well, and there's also an element for me of, you know, the the Rangers and, the, the like, the Devils had to play the Rangers, finish the series off. They play, you know, they just played tonight, as we talked about while we're recording. So that's that was Monday. They played Saturday. And Carolina's been sitting there at, ho- at home since probably after, you know, at the very least since Saturday morning. Right? Yep. And just waiting for who's next. So... I think the fact that the Devils played two extra games, we'll see. I mean, that, that, that can help you and it can hurt you in game I, one. I don't think it hurt. I don't think it hurts you in the first round going into the second. I, I don't think it hurts a team like Carolina and the kind of coaching that they go through. But I think that it's at least something you have to watch for for the first 10 minutes. I agree. And Fair. so we will see. I, I still think Carolina is the better team. I think, you know. The funny part is, is I, from the get-go, just off of the first-round predictions, 
had the Rangers winning the series against New Jersey and then had the Rangers beating Carolina. So I did have Carolina winning in the second round, but I did also have the Rangers getting through. So it, it is interesting uh, now that the Devils are shitting there. So uh, well, you, see, so for you, this is easy. You're going to keep everything the way it is. I'm so gonna, Carolina's I'm winning. Keep Carolina. Um, I think it's six games. I, I yeah, man. So I think it's six games, but I'm leaning more towards five. Honestly, um, maybe I'm an Akira Schmidt doubter. Maybe. <laughs> I, Maybe, but I just don't see. I don't see Carolina allowing the kind of space that the New York Rangers allowed for the Jack Hughes and the, the Nico yeah. Heischer and all that kind of thing. And quite frankly, I feel good about my first round prediction because I mentioned that the biggest, most impactful Ranger was going to be Jacob Truba. And his biggest impact might have been the status of Timo Meyer heading into the second round. Well, Meyer came back. Did he, he came back. He was at least on the bench by the end of the game. Oh my goodness gracious! So I'm was not. That, was that me in the crowd there for a second? Sorry. <laughs> um, there's a guy who um, looked just like me. That, that was, was really weird. Funny. Um, um, cue, cue up the Spider-Man meme. Yeah. Right. Um. Um. So I'm similar to you, but different from you at the same time. In this, I'm going to pick Carolina as well. Okay. And I'm also going to say Carolina in six. Are you more on the seven game side of things? I'm, t- I'm teetering okay. towards seven. I just th- there's some vibes going on now with the Devils. You know, you got when you're down two zero in a series and you got to win four out of the next five to make it. I get that. There's a little bit of vibes going on, and and you know what, the goalie that nobody thought would be winning the playoff series that just won the playoff series has them vibing pretty good too. I would say. So I think I that that plays. A, I think that plays a factor. And for the record, I'm not saying the, the, the Hurricanes are going to blow them out of the water. I just think that it, every game might be one nothing, But I don't see the Rangers get or the, the Devils getting a whole lot of goals by Frederick Anderson. And do you know or what's in, or whoever you know ends what's up in, in that. Do you know what's interesting for me about this one, too? The Rangers and the Hurricanes share something in common that the Devils don't have yet with their group, it, which is experience. Both of those teams have more experience than the Devils will by the end of this year. So there's, no, there's just no way. Yep. But the Rangers also have a lot of players who are on the older end. You know, you're not bringing in spring chickens in Tarasenko and Kane. Right. You know, you're bringing in guys with mileage who may not have been completely healthy by the end of the year. Who the hell knows, right? I feel the exact opposite about Carolina. And they, I'm not saying that they don't have older guys. Like, I mean, because Stasny and Stepan and, you know, and but they're, Brent, they're, Brent Burns are doing stuff. But, but who's carrying the play? It's Aho and Nakash and Jarvis and, you Fast know. And the, the young guys, yep. And Kokaniemi, like you said, who's on the yep. younger side and, you know, all that type of Like, yeah, it still comes down to that. And that, to me is going to make a little bit of a difference because now you don't just have to counter. I like, I believe that the Rangers were a team that not only had the experience factor there in terms of, yes, look at all this experience. They got, look at all these veterans. I think they play more methodical than fast. And I think, and I think that as structured as Carolina plays, they play fast structure. Absolutely. So I think the speed adjustment may be a challenge. Like, it's almost like the Rangers knew that there's a playoff speed from the regular season speed, and they gave it to the Devils in the first two games of the series. And then the Devils figured out, like, in game three, oh, this is how we have to play these games. And then they got it figured out, and all of a sudden they were faster and better. And I don't think that's going to be the way it is with Carolina. I just don't see it happening that way. Fair enough. All right, so we uh, we both have Carolina in six, but kind of on... Opposite sides of six, as it were. Yep. Uh, the other matchup in the East is a good one, and we, we touched on it briefly earlier. It is the Toronto Maple Leafs that just got over the hump and won their first series in almost 20 years against the Florida Panthers, who <laughs> probably just kind of expelled all their energy to pull everything out to beat the Bruins. You know, you're down 3-1. They played three back-to-back-to-back win-or-go-home games. You know, this is a desperate team that's been... 
emptying the tank for, uh, quite frankly, about six weeks now. Um, at some point, it's got to fall off, but it hasn't yet. Um, where are you at on this one? Definitely a long series. Definitely a battle because you're going to have... I mean, you've got two teams that are feeling great about what they've just accomplished. One that got finally got past the first round. The other one that just took out the best team in the league this year. that was, Like, by a mile. And and did it in comeback fashion. Yep. So now, overtime game seven. Crazy. So now what? Like, I don't know who comes into this with an edge. I guess Toronto, for not having to play a game seven, comes in with an edge. I mean, they also definitely, get definitely an extra couple of well, days. Toronto of has Toronto has two advantages going in right off the bat. They didn't have to play a game seven, and they're going to get to play on home ice as opposed to going on the road like everybody thought they were going to have to do. Instead, That's they true. get to beat. They get to play at home. That matters, and I think that that could even be exactly what sways the series a little bit. I'm going Toronto in seven. Wow, Toronto and seven. Okay, because um, I, I just can't overlook. We didn't, you know, we talked a lot about the Bruins when we were talking about that Florida Boston series because of the epic proportions of what happened to Boston. I, I don't want to discount the way Florida did it because it came from everywhere. Kachuk was outstanding, and Montour had another great series. Verhage had a great series. Like they got it from all over the place, and then down to when you're watching Game Six, season on the line, and who is scoring game tying goals? Zach Dalpy. And who's scoring a game-winning goal? Etu Lusterinen. Like, and you made a goaltending change halfway through for a guy who, as far as I'm concerned, has accomplished everything he can in the regular season and throws his body around like nobody's business. That by at, at his at his current age, I don't know how he's still able to do it to an extent, but he's still doing it. So I'm not writing off this Florida team in five games against a team like Toronto just because Toronto finally got past you know, the demons, and now they're going to, you know, go through a team that should be, you know, that everybody thought was going to be out of the playoffs in game five. I'm not going to do it. So my thing with this series, it's not just that Toronto won and that Toronto got over the hump. It's how and who from Toronto. So going to that 4-1 game, the, mm-hmm. the comeback goals, it's Matthews from Marner and Nylander. Mm -hmm. And then Matthews from Nylander and Giordano. And then Riley from Marner and O'Reilly. And then Kerfoot from Giordano and Nylander. Yeah. It's the core. It's the whole core. That's Those are the guys that when the coach says, we got to get the big guys going, that's, that's them. That's them. And then... You go to game six, and I, or, and I know we touched on this briefly earlier, um, but it was Matthews from Brody, and then in overtime, it's Tavares from Nyes and Riley, and like Tavares, Riley, and Matthews, again, there's your core. Austin Matthews has scored in four straight games coming into this series, too. Yeah. Like- and so it, to me, you have the big guns running, Ilya Samsonov has looked Perfectly serviceable, and oh, by the way, Matt Murray practiced today, so he is potentially available as an option at some point if you need him. We're in the playoffs, so Matt Murray, you never know. Yeah, I heard he's number three still, because I assume that would be absolutely. His, I assume it would be Samsonov, and then Joseph Wall, and then yeah. yeah. Um, great, but regardless, great name, great name for a goaltender, right? Fair, <laughs> right? <laughs> Nickname Brick. Um, yeah. So you do have. Him is, you know, a theoretical option. But to me, you have the big guns running. And then on the other side, again, you got a team in the ta- in the Florida Panthers that have just been playing meaningful games for so long. That you start to worry about it a little. Right. And the, the Toronto Maple Leafs have been here before, kind of. They've been to the first round before. Mm-hmm. They know what the first round takes out of you. So, oh, yeah. In the weeks leading up to the postseason, we saw them resting guys. We saw them utilizing some different lineups. We saw them utilizing a pretty heavy rotation. Resting guys. Yep. They should, in theory, be more well-rested, better prepared physically for the second round. Because, like I said, Florida has been hanging it all out there since two, three weeks to go in the regular season. Because that's what they needed to do to make a push. I think 
the Toronto team that showed up in Game 6 was closer to the regular season Toronto team. Mm-hmm. And that Toronto team was 20 points better than the Florida Panthers. So that's kind of where I'm at on this series. Um, I have Toronto in five. Wow. All right. Yeah. I'm I and maybe I doubt how much a goalie matters. And maybe Sergei Bobrovsky is, you know, he's on. Maybe he's here to stay. He's ready to go. But I don't know, man. I just think the Leafs are that they look too powerful, too dominant. The thing that's going to happen now, and like I said, because there's a lot of people that are going to sit there and say, as a result of what happened for Toronto, that everything, like the stars are aligning. They finally have done it, you know, to get past the first round. It's their year. I just think Florida's heard it all before and wants to have a say in that. That's all. And I, I still I still have Toronto advancing, and I think that... It, look, if if we if we end up right about the team, at least you know length is debatable, obviously. But right. if we end up right about the team, what a conference final that sounds like! Carolina and Toronto. Carolina, Toronto, man. And we know we've seen it before. Carolina wins a couple playoff rounds. That town gets up. Raleigh yeah. Raleigh turns into a hockey yeah. town when the Canes are making a run. It'll be a lot of fun. Uh, so well, I'm gonna make a whole footnote thing at the end of this because there's. Because it, the whole way the first round played out, stuff just keeps getting interesting around the league. So Yeah, so two two more series to talk yep. about here out West. west. Uh, you want to do Seattle and Dallas first? Sure. Okay, um, I talked about this a little bit earlier. Maybe I'm a, you know, a Seattle hater here. I, 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 if you've been listening to this show for a while, you know I've been talking all season long about Miro Heiskanen and, and Jason Robertson. I've been talking for a couple of years about your rope bay hences, and I have the Dallas Stars in man. This is the this is the interesting one because I think Seattle's a good team. Um it's gonna come down to Philip Grubauer and just how long he can continue just being stellar, and he has been absolutely stellar during these playoffs. Um I'll take the Dallas Stars in six games. But I wouldn't be surprised. Quite frankly, I wouldn't be surprised with any result out of this series because it's just that time of year. It's it's going to be such a good series. I'm very excited to see how it plays out. I definitely am too. Um, I'm not going to discount Seattle anything with the way that this you know with the way that they just played. They took down the defending champs. Anything is possible. But I think that Dallas is just built the right way. I think that there's ele- there's elements of that team that kind of un you know uncharacteristically made it to the Stanley Cup final a few years ago because it was a weird we all know how weird that yeah. year was. Um But you know, like when you consider that, that like that was er- still early for Miro Heiskanen and I mean before Ottinger and all that type of stuff when they were in the final last anyway I'm going off the same thing that I felt with the first round which just was like like I had it going seven originally against Minnesota and my thought was Ottinger's not losing this time like the guy who keeps them in it the most isn't losing this time and yeah boy did he you know he sure didn't after game three did he you know no, like he, he turned it up <laughs> um so I, I mean, I got I had Dallas advancing either way. I had Dallas advancing if it was Colorado, to be honest, because I really think that that so Dallas I. is. I think Dallas is built for this right now. Yep. I'm also going to say six. Okay. Um, I'm very eager to see how Seattle looks at the beginning because you know what? That's really going to be a telltale sign for me. Is you know, I knew Seattle was for real in the series against Colorado the second that I watched how they were playing out game one. Once game one was yeah. over, I'm like, all right, this isn't going to be an easy, you know, like, like. They didn't look, they were not there to be pushed around by the former champions. They they were there to prove their place as a playoff team in be, the NHL. Because let's be real about something for a second, okay? Dave Haxtell teams that get to the playoffs. No, when he was in Philadelphia, how did it typically tend to go? I, like, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the Washington series was the first one. 
They lost the first three games. Then they won two. Then they lost game six. And it was close. (laughs) And game six was a one nothing final. And it was really close. But it doesn't matter. It wasn't the same. You know, it was one team. It was still kind of men against boys in a one nothing game somehow. And against Pittsburgh in 2018, they lost. They lost game one, won game two, lost three and four, won game five miraculously, and then lost game six. Had Pittsburgh on the ropes in game six, but lost it ultimately. Right. So, if Seattle would have followed the same script against Colorado, lost game one. Shows you they can play, then loses two more. Then maybe I feel like, and that's the thing about, that's why I said it. When, it, when they won game four in overtime, that's when it felt different. Because all of a sudden you're going, oh, you're, oh. Not, you're, you're not playing the three one down three one game where like, you got to somehow or other win three games in a row. Now it's, right, we're starting over. Up against of, the wall. Right. We're starting over best of three. And guess what? You've played hard enough that you could have really won, like you could have won game three. Yeah. And, Absolutely, they could have. Yep. Seattle is so, definitely not a bad team. Like, I'm, I'm not discounting them. I just, it kind of feels to me how the Rangers-Devils series felt in the East in the first round. It's, it's the team that's been there before against the team that's kind of playing with house money at this point. And mm-hmm. similar to Toronto, Florida, it's, well, you know, is it the juggernaut that should win? Right. At this point, I'm willing to call Dallas that team, that juggernaut. Um, just with the complete package they've put together. Miro Heiskanen had an incredible season. Uh, it, it, it feels like a very similar dynamic in the matchup. And I wouldn't be surprised if either one of the underdog teams there wins. If, if either um, Seattle or Florida ends up winning their second round matchup. But Oh, exactly. But if you play if you play these matchups a hundred times, I think the good the better team wins ninety five of them. So it it's hard to pick against Dallas. Well, and be, because you hit the nail on the head, you've got two teams that are absolutely playing with house money at this point that are already farther than anybody thought they would be. Yep. You, you've got one series on one series that we haven't done on the west side. That and we'll be getting into that in just a second. That is as even as it gets in terms of like. <sighs> Like, there is no expectation. There is no one team should make it over the other, kind of. It's like, either way, it's going to make sense, isn't it? The Western Conference Final, regardless of whether Seattle uh, shocks the world and makes it through, or if Dallas kind of wins as expected, regardless, it's going to set up a fun matchup, no matter who comes oh, yeah. out of the other matchup, too. Yeah, for real. It actually, yeah, it really will. Um, but the th- And the thing is, is I kind of can't, I can't put any label on Carolina, New Jersey, because there's a little element of it of, well, New Jersey ha- kind of is playing with house money too, because nobody really thought they were, like, even as a two seed, nobody thought they were winning the series, especially after the first two games against the Rangers. Yeah, it's a little different, though, than the four seeds beating the ones. Mm- well, which especially is, the which, ones they beat. Which is talking why, about the best regular season team in history and the oh, defending Stanley no, Cup champion. No, like. which, is, which is why I'm venturing also on, like, teetering on the side of, well, you know what? Carolina and New Jersey is the two best teams in the Metro all year that were yep. close at the very end. Either one could win, and I would get it. Absolutely. So, all right, know, we'll, we'll so see. One more matchup, and it might be the most fun of the second round. Um, this is Vegas and Edmonton. So yep. I'm, I'm going to start this one with what I said in the group chat <laughs> after, this, after Edmonton uh, advanced over L.A., now okay. that he doesn't have to play against Philip Deneau and Anze Kopitar, the Connor McDavid show is about to begin. Okay. And and I know I know what you're gonna say. I know you're gonna say that Mark Stone plays for the Vegas Golden Knights. But guess what? There's only one mm. of him. <laughs> and also name a single Vegas Golden Knights defenseman that's good at defense. I hear you there. I'll I'll wait for you to tell me it's Shea Theodore. <laughs> okay. Bra- um, Braden McNabb. No. Th- so when I talk about the Carolina, New Jersey series, you know, if if it had been Carolina and the Rangers, it might have been a whole lot of one nothing, two one, two nothing games. Mm-hmm. This series is going to be all eight to seven, 
seven to five, <laughs> four to one. Like it, this series. Yeah, wait. So, so is what was the what was what was the score of game one between Calgary and Edmonton? I think it was eight to playoff, six. Eight to six, right? And this and is going to feel then, a lot so, like. And that. then game five, when Edmonton won the series, was six five in overtime. You're setting up for this. I am expecting it. No, and it'll tighten up a little bit as the series goes on, just because that's how the playoffs. No, are, but do you want right? to know what? Inter- do you know what's interesting about your point? The goaltenders aren't the headliners here. You got two guys who are playing Correct. well, but they're not the headliners. You're not oh. exactly sitting here. You know, if we look at the rest of these, I mean, there's you're kind of well, Samsonov against Bobrovsky is a decent matchup. Obviously, it's a good matchup, and Ottinger Grubauer can be good. Yeah, but you know but what's not- you know what's really fun and spicy? What's that? If Vegas decides to mix things up in net a little bit and they throw what, Mr. Put Jonathan, Jonathan Quick, Quick in? in there. Come on. Come on. But we even more- I if I know if, if LA had won. If it was LA, um, it would have been more spicy. But we might see four all four goalies in that series. I wouldn't be shocked. In Edmonton, Vegas, absolutely. This, I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if Jonathan Quick and uh, Jack Campbell made appearances. Absolutely. So this series sounds incredibly fun, but Kevin, yes. who you got? Well, I got to stick with, I got to stick with where I started because this this is one that I got I got three out of four teams right in the Western Conference, and my Western Conference final was still intact when all of this was over. Okay. So I've got to stick with what I picked from the beginning. I got Edmonton in seven. Okay. I, I also, absolutely, I absolutely, a thousand percent believe this is going to be a seven-game series. I don't disagree with you. I I think this series, out of all the matchups in the second round, um, so like we looked at the first round and there were all these incredible matchups and most of them lived up to it. And it was a really great first round. Looking at this second round, I think the Metro looks like it could be maybe a little bit low event. Um. The other two could be swingy, depending on what kind of team shows up. I think this one has the potential to be the most fun playoff matchup we've had in a long time. Definitely. Um, so you also I also have wanted... Jack Eichel versus Connor McDavid as a little bit of an underrated storyline. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Mm-hmm. So this is the fun stuff of this because this is what happens out of the first round. I just want to, and I can, I have to. I didn't eliminate one a, team. A yet Vander Kane me. has to successfully manage multiple nights in Las Vegas. <laughs> like there's <laughs> uh, a lot of storylines in this series. <laughs> there, oh, there's definitely a lot of storylines. Um, the thing I always like to do when the playoffs begin is look at the 16 teams that made it and start going through when when they last won, right? If if ever. Because there's always some charm to the team that's never won it before, right? And we are now down to eight teams left. Right. And, and, and within 24 hours, or a little bit more than a 24-hour period, the three-time defending Eastern Conference champions were eliminated. The President's Trophy winning record-setting regular season team was eliminated. And the defending Stanley Cup champions were eliminated. And, and a now, team that made the Eastern Conference Finals was right. eliminated. And now the team that made the Eastern Conference Finals against the defending three-time Eastern Conference yeah. champions has also been eliminated. That means that the most recent Stanley Cup champion that is still alive in the playoffs are the Carolina Hurricanes from 2006. That's a 17-year drought. Yeah, we're going to be breaking some droughts this uh, this offseason. You this is how, no, this is where it gets post. even crazy. This is where it gets even crazier. You have that drought. New Jersey's is 20 years from 2003. Dallas's is 24 years from 99. And then you go back to 1990 for Edmonton, 1967 for Toronto, obviously. And obviously Seattle and Vegas. And don't three have teams one. with yeah. none. Wait, 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 wait. Seattle, Vegas, and Florida. Florida. Okay, that's right. And, and I just want to let's play now. So let's play this one out. Because so Vegas is playing Edmonton. That's a team that has never won the cup. Now has only also been in the league since nine or since 2017. Right. So it's not a long history. I know we're going to say the same with Seattle, but still. 
So you got Vegas, who's never won it, going against the team. By, Ned- by the way, we do still need your official prediction for that series. Like we are still for which one for Vegas Edmonton. I said yeah. I said Edmonton in seven. Did you say Edmonton in seven? Okay, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know if I said it as well. Um, I you, do you, also. You did. We both agreed because you, we both said it's going the distance. I do also have Edmonton. I I do think it goes seven. But um, okay. So Vegas, who's never won it, going against Edmonton, who hasn't won since 1990. 30, 33 years. Dallas, nineteen ninety nine, against Seattle. Never in two years, obviously. But also, right. but also, like if you go back through the ancient history of Seattle, yeah. Hockey, yeah. I'm not, no, I'm not going all the way that far. But the point is that it took a, it was a long time before Seattle had a hockey team again. So now that's it's fair. back, and it's like a big. That's why it's a big deal, right? So you have the possibility staring you in the face right here. Of two teams that are the most two re- most the two most recent expansions, who have never won a Stanley Cup, playing for a shot to go for the Stanley Cup. Or you've got the or you've got another possibility here, which is to keep the All Canada Stanley Cup final alive with Edmonton. Man, you know, and I'm not you throwing. Think, you and think I'm Sportsnet wants that? <laughs> and I'm not just throwing Dallas out the window by not really mentioning them for anything. But you know what? Right. You know what's cool about Dallas in this? They've only got one. Yep. The one that we talk about is the one they've got. That's the one. Yep. Yeah, by the way, okay, for people watching on YouTube, can you see where my finger's going? Do you see what that is? Yep. That's the moment that we're talking about. Um, yep. And then you go to this matchup in the, on the East. Florida, who's never won against the drought. Toronto. Yep. Wild. Some one of those two teams is going to be in the conference finals. Correct. Yep. And then, then the two most recent teams to win are now playing each other. So one of them's gone. I'm knocking one of them out too. You know, we love that. The that is what we love. The beautiful game. The playoffs are the best eight weeks of the year for sure. So without a doubt. Just imagine, and obviously, like I already hinted at the other part of it, which is, can you imagine if we would were to get. Toronto Edmonton or like like there are tons of matchups here that just would be brilliant Toronto Edmonton uh, Vegas Seattle in the conference final would be something Toronto Vegas oh my god Toronto Vegas think about the spectacle um how about how about Dallas New Jersey the two coaches who went Mm. who used to coach in the other place Mm. that is fun that would be fun um Give me Edmonton, you know, Florida. Give me the uh, worst flight possible Stanley Cup final matchup. <laughs> well, I was gonna say, give me you know, Florida, Seattle, Florida, well, Florida, Seattle. Go cross country. I mean, Edmonton, Edmonton's right there too. It's oh, I know. Or or you go Florida, Vegas. Either way, yeah, you would be getting. But you got to go cross. You got to go cross country and go through. Oh no, I'm just picking those and go through three time zones. I'm just picking Ugh. the. I, I was just picking Florida and either Vegas or Seattle right. and that because of you know guaranteed first timer. And then how about uh, how about the kill the NHL matchup? We got Carolina and Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> the network sob. ESPN sob. Is that the one that kills it, or is it, or is it Dallas, Florida? Mm, Dallas. Huh. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. All right. You know what? You already know what the dream is. The dream is Toronto, Vegas, or Toronto, Edmonton. Absolutely. At this um, point, the best market that's left on the Eastern Conference side is Toronto, and you can take your pick between one of the two expansions and Edmonton. I mean, look, I think Dallas is a, I think Dallas is a good hockey market. Don't get me wrong; I actually think it is a really good hockey market. Yep. Just you know, it's just you know what the best match. And oh, by the way, I also have a vote for a great coaching matchup in the final. Okay. Give me give me Carolina Vegas. Oh yeah. Give me Rod Brindamore and Bruce Cassidy. Oh yeah. Uh absolutely. So the good news is, okay, we got good news and bad news. Which one do you want first? You want the bad news first? Sure, let's do the bad news. The, the bad news is that brings us to the end of today's show. Yes, that is the bad the news. The good news is, is that even for our next show, which will be after this upcoming round, we will still only be halfway through the playoffs. <laughs> So we will be back in approximately two weeks after this second round wraps up. Uh, we'll we'll let you guys know, you know, as we get a little closer. 
Uh, in the meantime, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, follow us over there. Subscribe to us on tw- or follow us on Twitter at YWT Podcast. Follow Kevin at Kevin underscore Durso. Find the show everywhere you find your podcast: Facebook, Instagram, etc. SportstalkPhilly.com. Make sure to check us out over there. Uh, a lot of great coverage over there for all your Eagles, Phillies, Sixers, etc. The coverage on absolutely everything over there. Um, Kevin, what series are you most looking forward to over the next two weeks? Ooh, that's a good one. It's a good um, one to get out of here on. I think I'm personally the most excited for Vegas and Edmonton. I think matchup wise, that's the one I'm looking the most forward to. But I can probably pull like really quick. I can probably pull one thing from each because I'm looking forward to another run of home games in, against for Seattle. I'm kind of looking forward to whatever Toronto's got in a second round. You know that kind of thing. I think Carolina, New Jersey is going to be an intense series more than people think. That's what I'm looking forward to. The but I think I think you're right. Vegas and Edmonton's the most. I think it'll the be most the most intrigue fun hockey behind it and. Yep. And hey, by the way, if you don't want to wait for my thoughts on the show for two weeks, follow the Instagram page. Or, there by the go. way, by the way, my handle is also for my own YouTube channel as well. You can follow oh, there you me go. there, too, because I've been posting those. They've been doing pretty well, actually. I'm not going to lie. Some of these little quick 60, you know, these quick 60 second hits oh, that you man. can throw out there, they've been doing pretty well. So Kevin's going to be an influencer by the end of the playoffs. Let's go, baby. I hate myself a little bit for All it. All right. I'm not We'll be back in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're about, we'll be halfway through the playoffs. We're on, we're on our way to crown and a Stanley Cup champion. We'll see you in a couple of weeks.